Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning. Get some gubs. It's so nice to see you. And welcome to the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. It's episode 349, and it is a special episode indeed because it's a good, good Friday show. <laughs> well, at least we hope it'll be good. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver pronouns, he, him. Hey, Mr. Beaver, and with me, as you can see, also in white, and we did not blue. coordinate, is my good friend. Oh, that's blue. Oh, yes. Okay. Baby yes, blue. it is a lightly blue. Make yes. my eyes pop. See? Yes, it is. Yes, it is a nice baby blue. Wow. Okay. Okay. For a second, I thought it was white, and there was just a little bit of shadow on it, but it is indeed blue. All right. My, my co-host, my brother from another mother, and my producer. Because without him, I'm literally nothing. <laughs> Mr. Grizzly. <laughs> uh, as we said, we have a good, good Friday show for you. But before we do anything else, let's ask Mr. Grizzly how your mental health is doing today, sir. Well, um, my beloved decided that because she was up at 445, I should be wide awake at 5. Now, it's no secret that I have a 5 a.m. alarm that wakes me up, and I roll over and I look at it, and I, go, and I hit it, and I, I try and drift back to sleep until the second alarm goes off at 6 when I slowly get out of bed and start my day. But this morning, both my beloved and my giant white puppy dog thought that they should sit on me while in bed and, and talk to me to make me get up. So... I, I, I lied in bed for another 45 minutes and then got up and took the puppy dog out where she continued uh, to, to do their, her crazy jumping kangaroo, kanga dog thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you that in a moment once I download the footage of her trying to jump and catch a, uh, take a ball out of my hand before I could throw it. She's quite the lunatic maniac dog. And I love her dearly, but it's like, oh my God, this dog has more energy than humankind put together. So when I wake up, which will probably be at some point during the show because I'm on my first coffee and Bridget was kind enough to make a, a bagel uh, with a egg and bagel sandwich for me. So, you know, I'm, I'm slowly waking up. Um, yeah, I, I think my mental health is good. I think I'm just not fully awake yet. Okay. You know? <laughs> that's, and that's as real as it gets. That's as real as it gets. I mean... Yeah, All right. I, I literally don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, for us, because I know people are waiting for bated breath. I mean, I mean, if you've been following the social media, as you know all about it already. But uh, thank you, Kid Vim, uh, on the congratulations on We Will Rock You. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, opening night was a smash. We killed it, killed it, killed it, nice. killed it. Uh, we did really well on opening night with audience, but uh, our pacing was even 
better last night. The energy was even better that we were hitting the jokes oh, joke. harder. Uh, sorry, that's my phone in the whoops. background here. I'm just trying to get the footage. Oh, sorry. Keep going. And, uh, and all that good stuff. Uh, so uh, it, it went by way too fast. Way too fast. Uh, and fortunately, uh, any kinks that we had uh, with my performance uh, or being able to make the stage entrances and all that kind of stuff on time because we were having a couple set transition issues uh, all got resolved. So everything went super smooth. Uh, it was great show. Uh, another wonderful, great, generous, kind audience standing, clapping, cheering, mm -hmm. uh, laughing, all the good stuff at all the right spots and uh, swaying arms at the end and all that good stuff. So, um, yes, 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 yes. It, it's a lot of fun. A couple of us went out for uh, a, a drinky poo afterwards to celebrate. Um, and uh, you may have noticed while I was... Um, holding my cup of OJ this morning that um, I fully committed to the bit. <laughs> I see that, yes, yes. Full commitment to the bit. Full commitment to the bit. Uh, I do my own stunts and my own nails. <laughs> my own makeup, my own hair. I do it all, kids. I do it all. <laughs> I sing, I dance, I do my hair, I do my makeup. Yoo -hoo. Um, no, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I knew going in that we will rock you. Um, basically, during my audition, they asked me something. I turned around and said something like, you know, would you be willing to take like a really small part? Because some people are only going to auditions if they'll, you know, they'll get a, a principal or supporting mm -hmm. role. And if not, not interested. As I, and I was like, oh, yeah, I just want to be invited yeah. to a party. <laughs> so, <laughs> apparently, I charmed pants off them when I said that. <laughs> so maybe that got me and it wasn't my beautiful singing voice, allegedly. Um, but, uh, yeah, because that one surprised me, too, when they turned around and said, oh, my God, you've got such a beautiful musical theater voice. I, I do. <laughs> I thought I had, like, maybe a blues bar voice or something. But, uh, so, yeah, I was very, very, very happy uh, to be invited to the party uh, because I knew that this was going to be just fun. Mm. Just fun. And it is. It is so much fun got a great cast got a great crew the band is really cool um a couple of band members are really cute too <laughs> i have to say like damn uh, i kind of understand why uh no i shouldn't i, sh I shouldn't say in case somebody's watching <laughs> i don't know which band members <laughs> if they're watching i don't want the band members to know which ones i think are cute but we have a couple of cuties uh okay <laughs> take your word for it well you know well you know if you if you have that band groupy thing right yeah going on Let's we we have a line in, in the show goes like who wants to see my tits? <laughs> so I'm a groupie, and it's like the, there's a couple of people I'd show my nipples okay. to. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Uh, uh, breakfast conversation. So, yes, if you wanted to run away with the band, let's mm. put it that way. Uh, no, but seriously, a uh, uh, great group of people. Lots and lots and lots and lots of fun. Very supportive. Um, and yep, we're getting to the point now where we're uh, um, we're starting to cool. play on the so, so not just like counting the steps mm. and you know, go. Oh my god, I hope I don't screw up. Like we're now we're confident that Able we're to not going to screw up and that we and that we've got something good. So now we're uh, we're a little more present in the moment. Like this, so when the laughs are there, we know to hold rather than being too nervous and just rushing to the like, you know, giving mm -hmm. some time for the laugh to fade rather than just rushing to the next line and all that kind of stuff and being able to milk a couple of moments and all that stuff. So, um, lots and lots and lots of fun. And I'm suspecting that uh, people would want some images here. So, um, this is from after the show we uh, went down to daft brewery here in kingston which is the place that uh, allowed us to host those two karaoke nights to promote um this is our wonderful stage manager shauna right here uh holding hands with rowena way uh, that name rings a bell 
Yes, because uh, remember a few months ago we showed you a can of beer that had an image of a drag queen on it. It was the first drag queen ever. It was Miss Rowing rowing Away or Rowing Away. (laughs) And uh, so there we were just hanging out here, having a great time uh, for a couple of drinks after the show. And um, for those who are, because I like to take pictures, Mm Uh, we have a before picture, before the night mm-hmm. out, and an after. And that's literally just about 15 to 17 minutes mm-hmm. difference. Well, stuff. So it takes a little longer for the makeup to go on yeah, and come off. <laughs> no, no. Here, I got, I got to show you this. This is, uh, uh, this is the descriptor that I was trying to give you earlier. This is my lunatic dog. Oh, yes. Okay. Lola, you're allowed to jump. Sit, sit, sit. You're allowed to jump. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, no, that's... that's uh... She can go <laughs> higher than that, too, by the way. Jeez. That's ridiculous. This is why we're at a dog park at six in the morning. Kanga dog. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Thank you. That's enough. <laughs> Kanga doggo. Jeez. Enter that dog in the. Oh, Olympics. and she can she can jump I higher. Jump. When uh, when we were at a, a tree, I go look. Is there a puma up there? And she literally her hind legs were right here and i'm six feet tall remember that she can really jump it's kind of freaky how much she can jump (laughs) dang it's like karen van halen somebody should do it like that with a a clip you know tiktok clip and put some van halen Mm -hmm. in the back do 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 jump <laughs> yeah da, hey right dad control dan great vertical indeed 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 all right kids and cubs um again uh, a little bit of a looser show uh tonight because again uh you know adrenaline and show and all that kind of stuff a little less time and again asleep during the day yesterday i think i have a feeling that my biological clock is going to be off uh for the run because I can't seem to get the adrenaline to come down before two o'clock in the morning, which makes for a very, very short night. <laughs> and since I'm gone already, uh, if I'm uh, taking afternoon naps from two to four thirty, and then leaving home at five for call time at six, and then I'm getting back to bed at two, we might have a couple of looser shows for you <laughs> next week as well. Uh, but we do have some stuff, and we hope that you will enjoy it. So, well, and uh, uh, trying to uh, line up a guest for Monday, um, I think, I think, uh, I spoke to him yesterday. Uh, we tried to have him on once before, but uh, scheduling just, it didn't work out. We were trying to get him on a few months ago. Uh, local uh, Super Kyle. You know okay. who Super Kyle is, right? Yes. Local guy. Yes. Uh, yes. He's, he's called Super Kyle because nothing stops this man. He's the most positive human being I've ever met in my life. And if anybody had a reason to be down, it would be him. And he doesn't let anything get him down. Um, so we're hoping to have Super Kyle on Monday morning. I bumped into him yesterday just by chance, and we had a, a brief chat. Um, so it, we'll, we'll talk about some uh, a little bit of activism and how he is, is uh, he's a loud voice for um, those with mobility issues because he's in a chair. And we had a we had a brief conversation about how we need to get the sidewalks in the downtown core of Ottawa uh, to a comparable level of functionality because of the fact that if I am walking a few blocks with a rolling tool bag and I'm having a difficult time, what's it like for somebody with a cane or a walker or a scooter or a chair. If I'm having difficult time with a rolling tool bag, big, strong dude, able-bodied, I don't know what else term to use there, but you know, somebody who does not require a mobility device other than this one, because this is a mobility device, glasses, without them, I, mm-hmm. I am visually impaired. So yeah, if, if I have a difficult time with a rolling tool bag, what's it like for somebody who has 
serious mobility issues. So that's one of the topics of discussion for Monday, just giving you a heads up. And hopefully, hopefully we can get Super Kyle on. You guys, you guys will love okay. him. If you don't know him, you're going to fall in love with him instantly. He is the most uh, joyful, happy, um, upbeat human being you'll ever meet. And, and this is a guy who has had serious medical challenges throughout his life, and he doesn't let any of it bring him down. He's just a, just a great person. Anyway, and you'll see him if you're if there's a concert. Ooh. He's usually there. Excellent, excellent. I look forward to that. I hope that we're yes. able that everything goes well. We're able to actually get him on that on the day. All right, uh, news stuff today. Um, I was trying. I was trying to decide whether or not I was going to go forward with this or wait for her to be available. But I am going to go forward with this, okay. uh, and hopefully, we'll be able to to have her on the show to come and speak to it. Um, but as you know, uh, Kits and Cubs, if you've been following the show, a uh, short while ago we had uh, Kit Angela, Jordan's mom, and Kit Leanne here on the show to talk about uh, Jordan specifically and what it is that she was doing. And shortly after that, she uh, she was also, well, sim simultaneously, she was also uh, caring a lot about the homelessness issue and uh, wanting to... Um, leading a charge to try and get municipalities, particularly Hamilton specifically, to open up armories as warming centers during the really cold snaps of winter um, uh, with various degrees of success. Let's put it that way. And soon after that came something called Camp Camping for Kindness 2, which started, which was only supposed to last about three or four days because... Um, in Hamilton, there was a discussion at the municipal level about a parking lot and whether or not it would be retained to be a parking lot. I think there's 26 parking spaces at play or whether it could be used as a site to develop uh, some tinier homes that could uh, serve as housing. And it seems that the city council was somewhat split on the, on the issue. I think it was split pretty much down the, down the road, uh, down the middle, sorry. And there was supposed to be a vote on a Wednesday that did not happen for some reason. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying for some reason, like it's a mystery. There is a reason. I just mm -hmm. can't remember it off the top. I just want to give the qualifier there. That did not happen. Um, the camping went on for close to a month. Um, there was some rumors at one time that there would be an eviction. I'm not sure if it was followed up upon. This is why I would like to get her on the show so we can uh, hear about that. Um, but eventually she did get a meeting with Mayor Andrea mm -hmm. Horvath, who has been taking a lot of heat justifiably so. online. Uh, justifiably so. Uh, Kit Laura, Laura mm -hmm. Babcock, who was on the show as well, is uh, very much seized with this issue. And um, so they had a meeting. And the day after the meeting, it was reported that they were looking for some outhouses for the camp, and the city decided not to provide them, that there was a church that was providing some money for them. Uh, a couple of days ago, uh, we heard that there was uh, an eviction notice uh, given, and that the camps were going to be dismantled by the authorities. Um. I'm guessing that that happened based on what I see online. But an interesting thing, other thing happened is on March 27th, 2024, an issue, a letter was issued from the office of the mayor of Hamilton. And I would like to read it. Please do. Mayor's statement on intent to veto bylaw 5 and 13 Lake Avenue South, Hamilton, Ontario. Today, I provided counsel and acting city clerk pylon Yep, pylon, with notice of my intention to veto the vote regarding the disposition of 5 and 13 Lake Avenue South for the development of affordable housing units. And for some reason, everything just disappeared from the page. Well, that's a bummer. Oh, there we go. Let's try that again. Okay. 
housing units. I firmly believe that leveraging municipally owned properties for the construction of sorely needed affordable housing is a vital step towards addressing the pressing and urgent crisis of housing affordability and homelessness in our city. The decision to use strong mayor powers is not one that I make lightly. I have always felt that the most effective leaders are those who inspire collaboration and teamwork. This has always been my style of leadership. That being said, at this very moment, over 1,600 people in our city find themselves without homes. Access to housing is a fundamental human right of every single person in this city. From my time as a community developer and housing advocate at McQuiston, <clears throat> sorry, at McQuiston Community Legal Clinic 30 years ago, to my years as leader of the official opposition to now as mayor of the city of Hamilton, I have always been firm in my belief that access to affordable, appropriate housing that meets people's needs is the most fundamental requirement for individuals to achieve their potential and live their best lives and is the bedrock of a thriving, prosperous city. Stable housing is at the heart of a person's physical, mental, and emotional well-being. As per the mechanics of the strong mayor legislation, tomorrow I will submit the formal veto documentation. Council will have 21 days to vote to accept or refuse my veto, with a refusal requiring a two-thirds majority. After 21 days, I will bring this matter back to Council, at which time it will require a one-third plus one majority to pass. Hamilton, our best days are ahead of us. It's going to take all of us to get there together. Now, based on this, it seems that... Uh, the veto will go through because if they're at half and half the first time and about half and half the second time, and they need a two thirds majority to override the veto. So unless there's people on one side that, uh, unless there's people on the side that actually want the housing who are incensed that the mayor is doing it this way, mm -hmm. they will vote. They will not vote against uh, the veto. So the veto, I assume, would pass half and half as well. And then they would vote again on it in 21 days and it would just require one third of the council to vote plus one, which she already has. If she's got half on mm -hmm. the first vote, unless someone changes their mind again because they hate the way that she did it or she does something in the 21 days that people find super offensive and then they turn, turn back on it. Um, so it looks like it's going to happen. So uh, what we have here, Kits and Cubs, is a, a situation of democracy is something that you do that yielded a result that is positive now why it is it took mayor horvath this long to publicly declare that she was willing to use her strong mayor powers and she wasted a lot of political capital uh straddling mm -hmm. that fence and surprised she didn't have to build the city for a surgeon to remove the splinters from her backside she rode that fence so hard. Jeez. Fence was begging for mercy. Um, so, um, because she could have, I mean, if she worked at that law firm 30 years ago and it was always a commitment, it should have been very easy for her to grab, go up to a mic and say, hey, you know, I support this. It's just about getting mm -hmm. there. They're finding a way to get there. But instead, she just decided to opt for radio silence and keeping her cards close to her vest, um, which did not serve her. Now, if strategically she did that because she wanted to raise public ire, because she needed something to point to, to say, this is why I'm leaning this way, <clears throat> maybe. Could have been a situation where, you know, um, she didn't want to spend the political ca capital with her counsel, said, well, guys, look at the public reaction. I'm sorry, but I have to. So I don't know what her strategy was and only she will know. And, you know, maybe we will, if we ask her like five years from now when she's retired and all that kind of stuff. And she wants to tell the tale of how it went down. Um, but right now it just looks like she decided to take a huge political hit to her reputation and capital for nearly a month, yeah. if not more. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, more to come on that kids, but, this is a story of a committed group of people who decided to get together. Do some good. Make some change. Not take no for an answer. Organize. When they kept on being told that they were going to be shut down, stopped, dismissed, did mm -hmm. it anyway, stayed anyway. And just when it looked like nothing was going to happen, that she was going to keep on doing this, mm -hmm. 
Mayor Horvath said, you know what? I am going to use my strong mayor And stepped up. I was, I was surprised because the way it's been going. I'd given up on her. I'd given up on her. Well, yeah, completely, completely. Um, and, but Kid Angela did not. Well, and, and to answer your question, Jim, uh, Jim says, get her on the show. Angela, we've had Angela on the show. We'll see if we can get her on again for, you know, uh, so we can discuss this a little bit more. But we have had her on as a guest before with Leanne. Um, it was a pre-taped interview because we had to record it in the evening, if, if memory serves. I believe so, yeah. But uh, we'll see if we can get her on again at some point in time. Um, I, have to, I have to drop in here something that I'm just reading about now. This is from two days ago, so the 27th of March. I just don't know what to say about this. And I'm not even going to mention the name of the person who tweeted it, but uh, the person who tweeted, I just missed it, but the loudest cheer of the night was for Polyev promising to get rid of all vaccine mandates. Mm-hmm. What the fuck is wrong with this idiot? I mean, it, it just just back in 2022, or 2021, sorry, today would be a good day for Trudeau's tearful apology for leaving the borders open to COVID and failing to deliver enough vaccines in January and February, resulting in a third wave. Pierre Polyev. But now he wants to get rid of all vaccine mandates. Yeah. When, the measles, when the measles vaccine was introduced in 1963, the number of measles cases dropped from between 10 and 90,000 a year to, well, by 1998, Canada had reached measles elimination status. I guess this is what the Conservative Party of Canada means by bring it home. I just... <laughs> And what was the thing? They're going to ignore the, what was it, 200 economists who, who told them about how the uh, carbon tax is, uh, does not negatively impact inflation or the, yep. add the cost. And we're not going to listen to them. We're going to listen to the common people because they're the experts. Yep. It's the Blaine Higgs thing as we, uh, uh, as Sean Rouse talked to us in, the, in his interview with us, his chat with us. Uh, experts, we don't need your experts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, ordinarily when I, when I need to get um, any type of heart surgery, which I've never, luckily, I've ever had to have, but someday I may, I'm just going to go to the, knock on my neighbor, neighbor's door and say, listen, uh, I got a scalpel here. Can you, uh, Hello, common, common person can you fix neighbor? this up for me? Just need you to do my salad. And then when you're done, can you zip me up? <laughs> and uh, yes, as we're talking about um, measles, you know, there are also other vaccines along the way that we need to uh, pay attention to. And one of them, of course, is the COVID vaccine because we are getting close to spring. Well, we are in spring, actually. Yes, um, we are spring. Spring and summer months, which means that for those of us who are uh, immunocompromised and those of us who are older, um, it's coming time for about the six month booster. So uh, provinces are now starting to roll out their spring COVID immunization, immunization campaigns. Okay. The latest health guidance suggests that high risk groups and seniors should go to the front of the line. In some provinces, adults aged 65 and older are already eligible. Ontario's program will start in April and BC will announce guidelines very soon. And according to modeling by the University of Stanford in California, uh, it shows that people 75 ages, 75 years of age and over, so very high risk group, getting two shots per year would still have a noticeable impact on infection on infection rates. So, um, just the 75 year olds and up, uh, making sure that they get two shots per year would greatly reduce infection rates in uh, respective countries, uh, at least in the United States. And I'm guessing that the numbers can be extrapolated to Canada. So uh, if you have someone in your life who is uh, in that age category, uh, please do encourage them to uh, get their shot um, when they do come available. As well as measles and COVID, uh, where I live near the Beaver Lodge, there is a meningitis B outbreak. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, this is from CBC, uh, posted March 8th, so a couple of weeks now. But uh, it seems that um, 
if you're, well, according to public health officials in the region of Kingston, it's one of a handful of regions in Canada, so there's more than just us, that are seeing a spike in local cases of invasive meningococcal disease, IMD. It's rare, but it's life-threatening bacterial infection that can infect the brain and spinal cord, causing meningitis and the bloodstream, causing septicemia. Up to 10% of people infected with IMD die, according to Health Canada, and complications include deafness, limb amputations, and permanent brain damage. There are almost 200 cases per, in Canada per year on average. Most IMD cases are caused by five types of bacteria, A, B, C, Y, and W135, though in Canada, Group B causes most illnesses, according to the Health Department. Uh, in this area, the Kingston Potnack Lennox and Addington Public Health is recommending the meningi meningitis B vaccine for people under age 25. It's not a routine vaccine, however, like meningitis C, which is typically given to babies at the age of one, or meningococcal ACYW135, which is administered in grade seven in Ontario, uh, specifically, because you know, we're talking in Ontario because we're talking about an outbreak, outbreak in Kingston oh, here yeah. in this article. Currently, no provinces or territories cover the cost of meningitis B vaccine for all children, according to the Canadian Pediatric Society. And at, uh, in Ontario, uh, it runs about $320, so $160 a dose with two doses required mm. in order uh, to get it. Um, Kingston isn't the only region seeing an increase. Last month, health officials in the eastern townships of Quebec called for vigilance after confirming two cases of, invas of invasive meningococcal infection in the region, one of which resulted in a death. The specific type of case is not well not yet not well known. And then around the time of the eighth, Manitoba public health officials also recently warned that the province had seen eleven cases and one death between December twenty first and February twenty ninth. The serial group one of one of those cases was identified as type B. Manitoba typically has six cases of IMD reported in a year. Normally six cases in a year. They had eleven cases between December twenty first and February twenty ninth. And it's in about two months. I, I had uh, viral meningitis when I was a child. Um, you name a childhood disease, I got them all. Now I was a vac I, There was no vaccine for that at the time. I had my MMR vaccine, but I still got uh, measles and mumps. Uh, but I was vaccinated, and then I got it very quickly. So I mean, it kept me from dying or losing my vision or having you know any serious issues. Well, other than my, you know, brain. <laughs> But, <laughs> sorry, that's kind of funny, I think. Um, but, yeah, uh, the fact that people are, are not vaccinating their children against diseases that are absolutely preventable is astonishing to me. And, and oh, I don't, I think the vaccines are bad. Really? I want you to go to, uh, out into the country and find a graveyard next to a really old church and walk through the graveyard and look at the number of headstones for children who never made it to their teen years, who died in childhood. Most of them never made it to 12. Why? Because there is no vaccines for the diseases that we can vaccinate against today that take lives. The disease doesn't care. The virus doesn't care. It doesn't judge. The virus just does what a virus does. It mutates and it eats everything in its path. It's what its purpose is. And you can prevent that with vaccinations. You know the smallpox vaccination? They first came out with that in during, I think, the American Revolution in the mm. 1770s. They came out with smallpox vaccinations then. Smallpox has been eliminated from humanity. Although there is a vial of the virus in vaults, one in, one in the CDC, I think, in Georgia, and there's another one... I'm not sure if it's in China or Russia. I'm not sure where. And the reason they kept it was because if we ever had a, a virulent outbreak of smallpox and, and one that had mutated, we'd need to have the original virus to work with that to try and create a new vaccine if need be. So, yeah. Um, James just sent uh, some stuff to me here. and I'm going to go pull it up. It's the Ipsos poll on um, vaccinations. And, and how the, uh, this is the National Library of, uh, U.S. National Library of Medicine. And they're talking about, uh, what is it here? 
vaccination results, conclusions. It's all here. I'll, I'll put the link in the chat for those of you who would like to have it, access to it. There's a fair bit of reading there. Thanks, James. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah basically, the, the, conclu- uh, the results of the, the study basically show that when examining public sentiment towards COVID-19 vaccine certificates and proof of vaccination measure- measures, there was a shift in responses over time. The proportion of participants strongly supporting these measures decreased from 66% to 43.1%, whereas strongly opposed was the second most common response and rose from 15.9% to 20.6% during the same time period. Concurrently, when examining participants' views surrounding mandates, many participants believed that their province was reopening at about the right pace, which remained relatively stable over time. Conclusion, our study's findings on the public's attitudes towards COVID-19 vaccine mandates and vaccine certificates in Canada may aid to guide and streamline the implementation of future similar public health interventions. Future research should include extended follow-up and a more comprehensive examination of trust in government institutions and polarized perspectives on vaccine mandates. Uh, This was a study that was published on March 11th, 2024. Um, I don't know how how recent uh, the data Mm-hmm. Um, uh, because it takes time between the time you finish, you know, writing an article and it getting published and, and all that kind of stuff. But it, um, what this seems to indicate is that um, the constant drumbeat against uh, vaccine mandates um, seems to be having an influence. <sighs> because in uh, 2021, you know, 66%, 63% of Canadians said that they supported vaccine mandates, and now that's less than half. So something has happened over the last couple of years to convince a whole lot of people that thought vaccines were good when necessary, that they may not be so much needed anymore. Mm-hmm. According to Kit Jimnier, the survey was done between 2021 and 2022. Uh, man. We're Canada. What the hell? Come on, man. We're the most educated country on earth. I think just behind, we were the number one. We slipped to number two behind. I'm not sure if it was Finland or Sweden. Okay. Or it might've been Japan. Cause I know we've been trading number one and number two with Japan for a number of years. I'd have to look it up and I'm not going to right now because I'm, tired and I have a whole bunch of tabs open here on stuff we're going to discuss this morning, but we're one of the most educated nations on earth. How can we be so stupid? How can we be so willfully ignorant to deny science, to deny actual peer-reviewed studies? And, and, and these peer-reviewed studies aren't just recent, by the way. We've had vaccines for measles since 19 what did i say 62 or 63 and yeah yeah the number one is south korea by the way south korea sorry yeah yeah i know south we've been korea trading one yeah in, uh, in 2022, almost 70% of its population aged between 25 and 34 had, intained, had attained tertiary education, which is the highest percentage of tertiary education graduates among OECD countries. In Canada, was second with 66.36. There you go. Great. And so Japan, we're, we're 66.36 of our population has post-secondary education, and we are stupid. But not 66% believe in vaccines. Yeah. Mandates. Can you can you explain that to me? Because I can't explain it. Yep. Yeah. Although I can show you. Oh wait a minute, that's weird. Oh, there we are. What? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Let me just show you this quickly. For those of you who are not aware, Canada has hit a new milestone. Hmm. Yes. New model in Canada. 41,007,372, somebody was just born. Uh, 41 million Canadians now. Look at that. Isn't that wild? I, I said mm-hmm. it before. I said by Canada Day, hell, we're going to, we're going <laughs> to, we're 7,000 past it and we're not even out of March yet. And what is Ontario at now? We are 5,000 away, less than 5,000 people from hitting the 16 million mark in Ontario. Yeah. Isn't that wild? That's pretty wild. Yeah. Uh, 
The world needs more Canadians. <laughs> and we're making them. Oh, man, oh, man. So, yeah, uh, that's... A, I am dumb. What's the difference between emigrant and immigrant? Emigrant is someone who leaves Canada to go somewhere else, or leaves their home country to go yes, reside somewhere else. An immigrant is Somebody someone that moves. enters into, yeah. a, into a country. So emigrant means I've moved so, away to become what they also refer to as an expat. Yes. So if I took up residence in the UK, I would have emigrated from Canada to Correct. immigrate to the UK. Exactly. Exactly. There you go. Um, just, yeah. See, there you go. True North Eager Beaver, Daily Beaver Morning Show. For all your questions. <laughs> that, that's one we actually had an answer to. Yeah. <laughs> Why did they do that? We don't know. <laughs> I have something for you here. Um, are you familiar with um, uh, Anita Vandenbeld? Yes, yes. Uh, she's uh, an MP, a liberal MP in the Ottawa area, I believe. Yes, for Ottawa um, South, I think, or uh, Ottawa West Nepean. Ottawa West Nepean. And Parliamentary Secretary for International Development. Yes. So I'm going to put this tweet up and then I'm going to play the video clip that goes along with it. Uh, Anita Vandenbeld, an often overlooked form of intimate partner violence is economic abuse. I presented a petition in the House of Commons to raise awareness of this important issue. But Pierre Polyev heckled me throughout the time I was speaking, trying to drown me out. We had economic abuse survivors in the gallery who told me they were deeply disturbed. <sighs> Why am I not surprised? Oh, you know, make tow. Yeah. Well, let's, let's watch this video clip, shall we? The petitioners are calling on November 26th to be named as National Economic Abuse Awareness Day. The petitioners note that economic abuse is a pervasive but often overlooked form of abuse that impacts 95% of women who face intimate partner violence, but it can also happen alone. The petitioners note that economic abuse undermines women's financial independence and amplifies structural barriers, especially for marginalized, gender-diverse and vulnerable communities. The petitioners call for funding, collection of disaggregated data, and a national day to raise awareness about economic abuse. Thank you. The petitioners are calling you could on hear November him 26th the whole time. Of women who face intimate partner violence. What a shit given. What a shit given. Uh, and like, it doesn't sound all that loud, but that's because the people in the house don't have the microphone on unless they're speaking. It's her mic is picking up him. Yeah. Right? From across the aisle. Yeah. And an aisle is at least two sword lengths long. And and remember, he's in the front row. She's not. She's yes. a backbencher, right? Yeah. So, and yeah. You can still hear him heckling her. Honest yeah. to God, if I sat in a gallery for question period, and they, anybody on either side of any political stripe starts to heckle, I would stand up and start yelling at people to shut up and let the speakers, let the person speak. Shut up. Shut up. I might be a little bit louder and a little bit more um, vigorous in the way I would yell that out, but you know what I mean. You yep. know what I mean. Yep. They, they would escort me out and I'm like, no, you cannot do this. This is the people's house. I have a right to be here. They are being disruptive. I'm not. I'm telling them to not be disruptive. They are being disruptive. Yeah. I'm just trying to listen to what that person's saying, but I can't hear it because these toddlers acting like petulant children on my dime yeah. need to be told to shut the hell up. Yep. Indeed. Uh, get James going. Now that we did emigrated and immigrated goes now explain the Fibonacci sequence. Now I'm not going to do that. The Fibonacci sequence <laughs> is a sequence in which each number is the sum of the two preceding ones. So 0 plus 1 equals 1, 1 plus 1 equals 2, 1 plus 2 equals 3, 2 plus 3 equals 5, 3 plus 5 equals 8, and so on and so forth. <laughs> I live with a mathematician. <laughs> oh, here we go. Look at this. Oh, man. We're going to go back for, for something we discussed yesterday because this is, this is uh, worth it. Common sense team. They're here. Get your common sense hockey jersey. It's called a hockey sweater, you chuckle fucks. 
there was a poem and a, and a, a short story uh, and, and a cartoon, and it was on the back of the $5 bill. It's the hockey sweater. Le. They're here. Order your common sense hockey jersey today on bringithome.ca. Those look more like field hockey sticks, not actual hockey sticks, and the Matterhorn is in the middle. Common sense for Canada. So Switzerland's mountain, two field hockey sticks, and a moose. It looks like something that should be on a beer can. One breath, you were screaming, everyone is using food banks because of carbon tax. Now you expect them to pay 80 bucks for a ridiculously stupid jersey. Sweet Jesus, stop being the stupid party. Canada deserves better. And uh, let's remember also that uh, none of us know where that money is going. That's correct. That's correct. And it might be quite possible that that money is not under the purview of any way, shape, or form of Elections Canada. Or even the Conservative Party of Canada. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, we also don't know where that money's coming from. As we have an election interference inquiry going on. Yes. By the way, that is picked up again. <laughs> Good. Uh, we had uh, the because we had mentioned that it had started, and um, and it has indeed started. But the first few weeks was a lot more legal wrangling, uh, trying to find out what all the legal parameters were, um, and then there was about uh, a couple of weeks where they were uh, had in camera sessions with national security uh, representatives because, as we mentioned, kids and cubs, um, you know. For a public inquiry, quote unquote, there's a lot of elements of it that will not be able to be public specifically because national security, right? Mm -hmm. That was the main concern. Uh, but there seems to be comment uh, from the pundit class that this particular exercise appears to be more serious and thorough than uh, the one that David Johnston, former Governor General David Johnston, was originally proposing. So at least there's a win there. Um, but uh, the committee has started again uh, asking questions, and these sessions, I believe, are a little more public. And they are uh, now meeting with uh, people from the diaspora, uh, diaspora communities, so ethnic groups, religious groups, um, that type of stuff, who have been targeted, and asking them about uh, their experiences. So uh, they are getting, uh, they're at the phase now where they're getting testimony for people who have been intimidated. Uh, by foreign governments. Uh, so that uh, continues. Uh, and if you're interested in following that, please do. Uh, hopefully we'll have uh, more updates for you as uh, it uh, progresses. But it is uh, still uh, going on. Uh, the other thing that's going on slowly, uh, slowly and quietly in the background is the Chris Barber Tamara Leach trial. Um, it had uh, started up again after a break uh, quickly. I think that they had only started up for, uh, I think that like earlier in the year, there was one day where they got together to uh, discuss some type of uh, motion. Um, and then they got that resolved. Uh, but uh, yeah, this trial has taken a little longer than a lot of people expected to, but it seems that the reason for that is that there's a lot of defense motions that, that need to be taken aside and then debated and whatnot, similar to what Trump is doing in the United States, always coming up with a new motion or a new thing, reason to protest or, oh, no, no, wait a minute, this happened, so we have to stop, or, oh, this happened, so you got to throw it all out. Mm -hmm. And these types of things are being uh, not as blatant as Trump, of course, in, in this case. Um, but uh, things like this, things of the such have been happening, but it seems that uh, the case is... Uh, is back on and in court and doing its thing. So um, again, very, very surprised that we are not hearing a lot about that because after the convoy and all the attention it took to the media, I really thought that there were, you know, there is one reporter from the Ottawa Citizen that's there all the time, but I really thought that cameras would be there all the time and we would be getting breathless daily reports of what was going on in the trial there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the level of media disinterest uh, for that trial, considering how much interest uh, the events that led up to the trial uh, generated uh, is actually surprising to me. But hopefully uh, we will hear more. And uh, one of the things I'm uh, probably going to try to do at some point is to try and write to the uh, person from the Ottawa Citizen that is actually uh, covering that and see if we can maybe get them on the show to give us an update as to what actually has been happening in the trial and what the mood in the courtroom is. 
So hopefully we will so be able not to heard get that anything thing. in a while. Right? No, nothing, nothing. The only thing that I heard was the, the, the it was back on. Yeah, and and oh, she she started a GoFundMe because apparently her legal fees are at half a million dollars. So she's hired every lawyer in Ottawa, and they're working around the clock on her case because half a million dollars, half a million, and wasn't her defense lawyer Lawrence Greenspan doing the whole thing pro bono? I'm not sure if he was until he dropped out. Yeah, he was did, doing it did, pro bono. But has he dropped out? That's the one thing I don't know. I can't. I was not. I, I, I was, know that she was having trouble with her lawyer, but I have not been able to find anything in the press. That's I right. don't know if it's the with this particular Just case, whether or not she was involved in another case. Could be. That's a lawyer because these people file multiple actions. So I can't tell mm-hmm. if it's Greenspan specifically or if it's because even in the article that I re- read on March seventh and the news about her switching lawyers, that rumor was out then. There's absolutely nothing in the article that says that Greenspan is not representing her. So, yeah, I've um, not been so able I'm to wondering anything. Yeah. So. so I'm wondering if it may be a secondary case that she's involved in that she's looking for a new lawyer here. Um, but uh, on March 7th, which was the, the sort of last update that we had, um, there was an interesting thing going on. Uh, according to the CBC, the judge in the criminal trial of two Freedom Convoy organizers has dismissed a defense application and agreed to consider arguments that the two accused acted as co-conspirators. Mm. Following an, an extended break, Chris Barber, Tamara Litch, uh, is it Litch? Litch? Or Leach. Leach, I can never remember. Leach, yes. Tamara Leach returned to court virtually on Thursday to resume their trial. They're charged with mischief, intimidation, and offenses related to counseling others to break the law during the protests that took over downtown Ottawa for more than three weeks early in 2022. Actually, you know, you mentioned that. Um, you remember that clip that we showed yesterday about the minister of the government of Saskatchewan and said, well, I don't recommend that people don't follow the law. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm wondering if... Um, the federal government would be so bold as to consider um, uh, petitioning for charges to be laid under, for example, offenses counseling others to break the law. Maybe. Because that's pretty much what Premier Scott Moe is doing. That would that that would be a just watch me moment. Mr. Scott will go, you can't do that. Just watch me. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Make a public call for it. Of course, but of course that would look bad because that, that would look like the federal government trying to dictate who gets investigated and charged or not. So they probably can't put themselves in a position PR wise to say that, but I bet you they thought of it. Oh I'm sure, <laughs> they, thought. I'm sure they thought was there. <laughs> bet you they all sat around the table with a drink and giggled their butts off while thinking about it. <laughs> But yes, uh, it seems that prosecutors are seeking to have the two accused charged as one, with evidence applying to both. Uh, Their lawyers sought to have the co-conspirator application filed by the Crown dismissed. They were not successful. In her decision, Justice Heather Perkins McVeigh said, despite a lack of direct evidence, there was enough circumstantial evidence to create a, quote, inference of a common unlawful design. She will now consider the Crown's co-conspirator application at the end of the trial. Um, Perkins McVeigh says in her decision that she recognized that there were multiple convoys and various groups that came to Ottawa for different reasons, including some who were not influenced by Barber and Leach. But she also pointed to evidence that Barber and Leach were, quote, part of the leadership of the Freedom Convoy, held press conferences, and raised money. She said there's evidence the two leaders, quote, looked for ways to distribute money to truckers on the ground so protesters could inferentially continue their stay in Ottawa and lock the streets. These are the inferences that can be drawn, and they mandated others to remain in Ottawa until the COVID mandates are removed or the demands of the Freedom Convoy met, her decision reads. The trial is expected to continue with the defense likely presenting its case later this month, possibly as soon as March 13th. So, of course, this article was written earlier in the month, March 13th. Mm-hmm. Um, already, the trial has stretched beyond the original 16-day schedule. It was supposed to be just 16 days. Arrested February 17th, 2022, one day before police started clearing downtown streets and of people protesting COVID-19 rules and airing anti-government grievances, Leach and Barber started their trial September 5th, 2022. We are now March 2024. Meant to decide whether and if so how the two should be punished for their role in the weeks-long protests that clogged the city's core and shook residents, the trial has been slowed by legal wrangling, technical delays, unprepared witnesses, and issues over how police evidence was disclosed. Defense lawyers have argued throughout the trial that Leach and Barber worked with police and city officials and stayed peaceful during their time in Ottawa. 
Barber from Swift Current's Saskatchewan was released a day after entering custody. Litch from Medicine Hat, Alberta, spent 49 days in jail, spread across two stints. The first followed her initial arrest, and the second followed her on a Canada-wide warrant for violating her bail conditions. Mm. So just a generally all-around good person. Wow. So they're trying all the legal wrangling and all that kind of stuff. And you have everybody out there going, gee, I can't believe they've been detained for so long. It's so unfair. They are prisoners of political prisoners and blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, if you stop complaining about every single legal motion, the trial can go much faster. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go that that's about like the most recent upsta- uh, update that we have on that uh, but again see, trial uh, may be restarted again in earnest on March 13th and um, not much it's very very little yeah it's, uh, it's like I said it's actually a little bit surprising to me the, that that's the case um, in economic news GDP numbers for Canada were released recently, and it seems that, um, well, things were a little better than expected. Damn you, Trudeau. Oh, I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) You you know damn well the Conservatives are going, shit, we can't blame it on them. We can't, you know, we can't give them, we can blame it on them when it's bad, we can't give them credit when it's good. Because, yep. you know, it, it's, so, it, when things go bad, it's his fault. When things go good, that's just how the market works out. Exactly. Now, it's not blistering growth. It's not bristling growth, right? We basically, uh, the Canadian economy grew at 0.6% in January, which is the fastest growth rate in a year. Mm-hmm. But the economy likely expand and and the likely ex- likely expanded zero point four percent in February. Statistics Canada said in Thursday. So basically, there's a zero point six number that seems to be the the confirmed number. There might be a few adjustments for January coming, and the zero point four is what they call a something like a flash number, mm-hmm. number that they expect will come for February. But they haven't had that. They don't have all the data in yet. So the 0.6 rate was higher than what was forecast by economists who were expecting growth of 0.4% of the month. So we got 0.6, which is about 50% more. December GDP was revised to a 0.1% contraction from zero growth initially reported. January's rise, the fastest since the 0.7% growth in January 2023, was helped by a rebound in educational services as public sector strikes ended in Quebec Statistics Canada said. Quote, the more surprising news today was the advanced estimate for February, which suggested that underlying momentum in the economy accelerated further that month, wrote CIBC senior economist Andrew Grantham in a note. Thursday's data shows the Canadian economy started 2024 on a strong note after growth stalled in the second half of last year. GDP was flat or negative on a monthly basis in four of the last six months of 2023. And uh, the good folks at CBC here have included a graph for us so that we can take a look at that, which I will uh, put up here for Mr. Grizzly to show. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you can see, if you're looking at the graph, it's by month, January, 2023. That was the 0.7% that we're talking about in the article. In February and in March, it was still up. April was lower, May was up, and then June, July was lower, stagnant uh, for the the rest of the summer months, and then up on October, November, down a little bit in December, then up again in January. So this is a good trend here, Mm -hmm. what we're having. And this is uh, what uh, the federal government is probably banking on uh, when they're going to be making their economic pronouncements and planning for the upcoming election cycle. Um, It looks like uh, the strength of this economy is speculating, uh, is increasing speculation about whether or not the Bank of Canada will start reducing interest rates. Uh, It seems that they want to see inflation numbers uh, go down a bit more, but we have gone, I think, from a core CPI, not not including gasoline, from 3.9 to 2.9 to Mm -hmm. 2.8 over the last three months. Uh, So that seems to be, and the decline to 2.8 was not expected, uh, went counter to expectations. So it seems that for the more uh, optimistic 
people uh, looking at economic forecasts uh, are basically saying that uh, the Bank of Canada could probably go right now to cut interest rates uh, because the data for the last three months, specifically not the last six months, actually show that inflation is uh, close to or below the 2% annual target. Um, but we don't have a full year's worth of numbers. So, right. But if we took the last three months numbers and multiplied them by four to make a whole year, assuming that they were going to stay constant, uh, we would be below the target, which means that the Bank of Canada could go now. So you have uh, people uh, on the business side who are um, a little more, um, let's say the LFG people, let's fucking go <laughs> cut these interest rates. <laughs> Saying, say, you made a mistake by waiting too long to raise them. Don't make a mistake by waiting too long to cut them. <laughs> Uh, of course, the Bank of Canada is looking at uh, other issues as well and other economic data, but it uh, and the prediction has been for quite a while that it would happen in the second half of the year. But there is uh, a little bit of speculation that maybe the Bank of Canada could announce the first rate cut as early as April. I personally wouldn't count on it yet. Bankers tend to be a little more cautious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then some speculation is particularly enthusiastic, uh, but it seems that there would be some in the second half of the year for people who are looking for a little respite. And uh, according to economists, they're looking that uh, over the course of the next uh, while, uh, might not be um, all within five or six months like the, like they went up. <laughs> but gradually over time, uh, you can expect a, a decline in um uh, the Bank of Canada's prime rate from 1 to about 1.2 to 1.5% mm. over the next little bit, which will bring um, a significant amount of relief if that were to actually uh, go through the system and uh, leave a little bit of uh, extra money in people's pockets. Um, according to the numbers... Uh, here, the bank in January forecasted a growth rate of 0.5% in the first quarter, and Thursday's data keeps the economy on a path of small growth in the first three months of 2024. The Bank of Canada will release new projections along with its rate announcement on April 10th. Growth in January was broad-based, with 18 of 20 sectors increasing in the month, StatsCan said. The agency said that real estate and rental leasing sectors grew for a third consecutive month as activity at the offices of real estate agents and brokers drove the gain in January. And on that, it seems that uh, uh, numbers for uh, house prices for people who are house owners, uh, because uh, coming out of COVID, there was a bit of drop uh, in the market and some stagnation for a while. It seems that those numbers have uh, started to going up again as well. And... Um, the, with the rise of the interest rates, uh, the marketing sector tightened a little bit. And now that people are talking about, now that they've stabilized, basically, that they've stopped going up, um, real estate has started to pick up again. And now that there's talk about interest rates going down, they're expecting that there'll be more activity in the real estate sector in the next mm. coming months. Uh, overall, service producing industries grow 0.7%, while the goods producing sector expanded 0.2%. And in preliminary estimate for February, StatsCan said the GDP was likely up 0.4% for February, helped by mining, quarrying, oil and gas extraction, manufacturing, and the finance and insurance industries. So we'll see how those numbers uh, hold up. But uh, as we mentioned uh, last year, uh, at the end of the year, when we were doing our retrospective shows, that uh, one of the most underreported stories in the news, in my opinion, was how Canada, on a macroeconomic level, which I know doesn't help you so much on your kitchen table uh, mm -hmm. discussions, but on a macroeconomic level, is basically uh, realizing a minor miracle here, uh, getting out of COVID <laughs> and uh, changes to the economy and disruptions to the supply chain, war in Ukraine, supply chain issues and climate change related supply chain issues uh, all happening at the same time while having the economy not go into recession oh lola stepped on your bits on your grizzly bits didn't she yeah she did yeah oh. i i recognize that look oh Sweet. We are now experiencing technical dis difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> too much and, love, Lola. Too much love. And that paw, <laughs> when it comes down, it comes down so hard and heavy. My God. Like she stepped on my feet, you know, and when I'm ah, wearing socks. 
and and uh, it's like i think she drew blood because she comes down so hard she doesn't know how big and strong and heavy she is kanga doggo my kanga doggo kanga doggo <laughs> see if i can get her Oh my god. That's, that's a cutie. Can I just say, may I say something? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I just want to say, thank God it's Friday. <laughs> and she's going to be with him all day. And I'm doing nothing. <laughs> this is ridiculous. It's getting ridiculous around here. Hello, Douglas. I love you. Hello, I love you too. <laughs> so, uh, some good economic data here. Um, as we mentioned, uh, it looks like we are going to be uh, hitting that soft landing, that mythical soft landing that we normally never are able to actually realize, but this time it seems it has happened. So this is all good data um, that's coming down the, the pike. And uh, at least in the United States, it hasn't happened yet in Canada, but uh, public opinion surveys about um, uh, confidence in the economy and confidence to be able to earn a living have started going up uh, and in favor uh, for President Joe Biden, um, their inflation rate is a little lower than ours at the moment, and GDP numbers are a bit stronger than ours. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually, you know, that's sort of what happens down there kind of happens eventually here too. So uh, for the last 18 months uh, going into election, it seems at least that economically the data is only going to get progressively better uh, for the government, which hopefully... Uh, we'll give them, uh, we'll disarm some of uh, PP's arguments uh, to allow for a bit of a fairer fight yeah. uh, in the upcoming election. I uh, wanted to ask you a couple of questions, sir, if mm -hmm. you may. Yeah. Looking at the calendar for the month of April, is uh, 13th, 20th, or 27th best for you? Oh, for Pubcast? Yeah. Uh, I possibly could not know at this time, uh, okay. but probably not, not probably not the 27th because that's uh, my nephew's volleyball tournament. Okay. So 13th or 20th. Then. So probably 13th or 20th will be the best. I don't think I have anything particularly impeding either because okay. the runs, the runs of the show will be over. Okay. And then for our mental health walk, uh, June 8th, 15th or 22nd. And, and we'll, what I want to do is, this is the plan. And again, we're trying to put this together as quickly as possible. So we'll have to register the cha the charity. And we'll have to set all that up. But, but what I'm thinking is we do the a 5K walk around the neighborhood and then end at the pump and do a pub cast. Okay, sure. You know. Okay, uh, that one I can't confirm a date on just yet. Okay, no problem. But I'm, I'm thinking either 8th or 15th uh, might be might okay. be ideal. But uh, if we can, if one of those is Father's Day weekend, that might be a good Father's choice. Day is the 16th, so the 15th is the Saturday, the 16th is Father's Day. That might be a good choice. Let's yeah. pencil it in, for, let's pencil it in there. Okay. I should be able to be free. Like I said, I, I don't have a show then or anything. All my shows will close. My third one will be closed by then as well. So that will actually be me time. Finally. <laughs> put in my calendar the mental health walk uh for june 15th penciled in we might be changing that between now and then but that's what we're looking at and we're still trying to get stuff together for that like it's not that's not going to happen overnight uh we've got a fair bit of work to do to try and make it happen whether or not we can i'm like this year it'll be a first it, it'll be the first and it, it may very well just be an awareness walk. I don't know if we can get a charity registered in time and get money, you know, and donations and that sort of thing. But if we can, great. And if not, at least we can, uh, we can start something, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And it would be, it would be here in Ottawa and Canada's capital in center town. Uh, I've, I've got a, a rudimentary 5k route planned and it would be uh, around the downtown core, center town, where the occupation took place. And then it would end at the lieutenant's pump, uh, where we would then proceed to have a pub cast for the day. And we'd have a lot of in-person live guests for that one, too. So we can, let's try and make this happen. I, it's, you know, it was just a mere last-second idea we had when Pete jumped in and, and talked about what he did. And I'm like, well, we should be doing something like that. So, yeah, the mental health walk. And, and. The idea behind it, for those of you who might not be aware, is is that uh, I think it's is it seven or eight out of ten 
uh, suicides in Australia are men. And I think the number like in Canada is seven of 10 or something like that. I remember we discussed it with Senator Brazo when he was on the show with us. And uh, this is something he's passionate about too. So we're going to see if we can get him involved to, to some way, shape or form to help a raise awareness and promote this and, and see if we can turn this into something good. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's a bit of a pipe dream. We're, we're trying to do this in two months. So it's, this might just be uh, literally an awareness thing because we still have to get a route planned and approved and we need uh, a, um, a uh, police escort if we were to walk through the streets. So I think for this year, might, we might just do a sidewalk walk, you know, uh, and maybe next year we can, we'll have a year in advance to plan it. So yeah, yeah. Let's see what we can do to raise awareness and, and if we can raise some money this year, great, but uh, I'm not holding my breath on that because we have a lot of work to do to get this put together to make it happen. And hopefully a lot of people can come out and attend, uh, join the walk and, and sit in person for a podcast. Yep. That would be wonderful. I would like that very much. And if, uh, that created an opportunity for kids and cubs to join in and to have a, a little bit of a meeting great after, yeah. I would and, and like here, that very much. Linda's suggestion. You can always make it a walk for awareness and tell people to donate to an already registered mental health charity. That's a good idea. If yep. we can't get all of, you know, this together for this year, we could just, it's going to be like a, a kickoff thing that we could do this year and, yep. and you can, you know, donate money to whatever mental health charity or mental health um, organization in your community. Because I don't want to just help people in Ottawa. I want to help people, well, around the world, but let's start with Canada first, right? Yeah, so we'll start here in Ottawa and build it out from there and see how it goes. It's, you know, I've I've... I've never been heavily involved in any sort of charitable work at any point in time. And uh, it's high time I do it. It's high time I do it. So uh, this is something that I am passionate about because I, I have mental health challenges. I don't make it a secret. And it's important that men have a place to go and talk because so many of us simply don't. We mm-hmm. just don't. There's so many of us that don't have a place. We don't have an outlet. We don't have anybody to talk to. So it's going to be an awareness thing, I think, this year solely. But if we can, if we can get some money to some local, local mental health charitable organizations and, and, and yeah, I know, I hate to say it, let's raise awareness, but it is what we're doing. Because people need to know. And I don't think people know how disturbing the stats are when it comes to men's mental health. I, I really, I really don't believe enough people know about how bad it is. Because if they did, I think more people would be screaming from the rooftops. What are we doing to our men and boys? Our husbands, our partners, our friends, our coworkers. What are we doing? We're not giving them the support they need. So let's try and let's try and and do some good. You know, I mean, we are building a community here on this little channel, and we want to do some good. We want to we you know want to we want to inform people. That's why we have this channel. That's why we have this show. We want to inform people, but it's not just about politics. It's politics and general culture. And one of the things in general culture is mental health. Because we talk about it. What's the first thing you ask me every morning? How's your mental health today? Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Matters and you're right, Jay. Everyone needs mental health supports at some point in their life. Everyone. There is not a human being on earth that will not be affected by a mental health crisis, whether it's their own or a family member or a coworker or a friend, everyone is touched by this. And we, we've kept it in the dark, hidden behind doors for far too long. It is changing. People are talking, but we need to do more. Indeed. Indeed. Um, just reading through, uh, the comments in the chat from the kits, uh, Kit Cassie, it gives us an update on the Coots 4 trial says that it's dragging out. They've been in custody almost 800 days, but two took plea deal deals and will be released soon. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't aware that two had yeah. taken plea deals, but, uh, there we go. Um, and then, uh, Kit Elaine mentioned something. I think this might be for the Leach and Barber trial, but I'm, uh, hoping that she can confirm it, says uh, they came back for defense, but defense called nobody to the stand. They are now finished until the August verdict, if that's the case. Um, wow. 
uh, not sitting in their own defense. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, that would that that would slightly surprise me because I thought they would take this as an opportunity to grandstand. But then again, it's not uh, the um, the public or uh, order emergency commission that's televised and every week can see. So it's not an not an opportunity really to perform. I'm guessing, given that there are no cameras. Uh, so maybe that's why they decided that it's not uh, worth it for them. Oh, well, possibly, possibly. possibly. Yeah. but yes, if they're not even uh, putting up a defense, they're saying, okay, you know, just take that. And uh, looking what the, uh, the prosecution brought in and crossing their fingers and hoping that that was not enough. Um, it is a strategy. Oh, yeah. It is a legal strategy. Um, sometimes it works for you. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, because sometimes while you're defending yourself, you can open your mouth and say too much. And <laughs> let's be honest, these are not necessarily the people who don't like to run their mouths. But they love to hear the sound of their own voices. I mean, Tamara Leach couldn't keep it in check long enough to not get thrown back in jail for violating their parole. So, um, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it might be another Trump thing. It's like, do not put him on the stand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just, <laughs> it will not help us. Um, but yes, uh, let's uh, see that. Uh, we have um, uh, Kit at Toronto Dan that says, Barbara and Leach dug their own holes and so did that lost soul, David Parker. Let's speak about him. Uh, because uh, he was on Dean's show again mm -hmm. uh, the other day. Uh, at first, I said I would not watch. And then I, I caught myself and said, well, I mean, I wouldn't really watch for what David had to say. I'd watch to see um, whether or not there were uh, some changes in Dean's uh, questioning style. Um, just for everyone to know, um, I am not talking behind Dean's back. Oh, no. <laughs> By the way, no. he's very aware uh, how I feel about the first one. We've even talked about it uh, ourselves uh, okay. in, be in, in between us. Um, so, um, and, and he is uh, quite, 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 quite open uh, to what it is I had to say. Uh, oh, okay. So it, it, it's, it's not uh, being refused, rejected. Uh, he's not saying I don't have a point uh, in any of that case. Um, so uh, I did watch it. Um, again, I was disappointed in a way because I thought there would be more discussion about substance, but it turns out that it was more discussion about their plans for mm -hmm. discussion it seems that uh, they have come to an agreement uh to have uh, a series of chats on various subjects and it seems that the chats may not only be between them but there might be some invited guests now and then to come in uh to help with some of those discussions and uh they're going to be respectful discussions um hopefully um but it seems that they've both agreed to respectful dis discussions. They've both agreed to um, uh, certain things that they will not do behavior-wise mm -hmm. uh, that will help uh, the discussion to keep flowing uh, rather than being pulled off uh, in many different uh, directions. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what what happens with that. But. Um, uh, yesterday's show, if people were looking to get into the meat of it uh, yet again, um, we were edged. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, so uh, it was more of a, an episode talking about the upcoming series and you know, kind of fluffing it and and uh, and promoting it. And uh, not just that, though, but explaining the, the reasoning behind it and the philosophy behind it and all that kind of stuff and how it came about. Um, but it was more, um, uh, it was probably more promotional than substantive if people wanted to get into the issues, but it was more positive um, in terms of uh, the execution than the, the first set of discussions. So um, it seems that for people who wanted uh, the actual uh, dean talking to or with uh, David Parker, the first real uh, such discussion of the like uh, will happen when the first of that series uh, comes down and it wouldn't have been the two discussions that are uh, that have actually gone by already um, so uh, taking the um, preparing the terrain mm. let's call it that uh, for what is to come 
Uh, I am interested uh, if there's going to be some some rules and there's going to be a frame around it and both are going to agree to it and call each other out if they, they don't hold to it. And um, uh, and it seems that this is a written agreement. So, um, you know, the, okay. yeah. The, that the, that there are terms. So hopefully, uh, we will have a product that is interesting. Um, I know how people feel um, conflicted. Uh, yes, by um, I understand that uh, people that have a message that seems to contribute nothing of worth or of value that is positive to the nation, uh, being given airtime. Um, that there's uh, some issues with they have some issues with that uh, but it's um, there is a valid point in um, not yeah. being made by people that say that we are uh, the sides are not talking to each other uh, enough and and that that is true um, my precondition for that kind of stuff though is uh, if I'm going to have this conversation, do I really feel that it's going to be a good faith conversation? Because a conversation with someone you don't agree with, that's a good faith conversation. That's great. A conversation, if you have a show like this and you bring someone with whom you don't agree, and it literally is, is going to be, I'm going to monologue at you and you're going to monolo monologue at me and I'm going to raise right. it. And you're just going to like talk right past it and bring back and we're just going to spend an hour just talking past each other or talking at each other rather than talking with each other. Uh, it's not really interesting content in that case. It's just Agreed. content that you know, people are on either who have pick and picked their team jersey win and go, hey, my guy just scored a point. Oh my God, I can't believe he said that. That's so horrible and terrible. And and people torque what people say and all that kind of stuff. And just doesn't really have much uh, much value or benefit. So we'll see what happens with that. But so far, uh, if all, all people involved adhere to the rules that they say that they have agreed to, it could be uh, an interesting conversation uh, to find out um, how do people who believe the things that David Parker believe get to the point where they believe those things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and those are the type of questions, the interviews and conversations that interest me because when we have our interview project, a lot of it is, you know, we want to know what makes you tick. So, yeah, uh, I personally would be interested in finding out that what, what makes a David Parker tick well, I've got and how they got to ticking in the way that they do tick. Well, let's address something about David Parker here, too. I sent you the, yeah, I forwarded you the email yesterday from uh, one of the viewers and listeners. Um, said, uh, was telling us how when I showed the, the post from Parker with uh, the pride flag burning and he's like... Uh, you know, I thought it was praying hands. No, it's high five. He's high fiving the people. It's not praying hands. It's a high five. Like, oh, connecting. Yes. Yeah. yeah, high five for burning the pride flag. That's what that was for. So, yeah, um, I possibly, mm -hmm. possibly, it, it, it means you, that you would, well, you, you would, yes, you would have to ask him if that's well, that was his intent in putting it up. But yes, it could be interpreted that way, uh, which was a new one to me actually. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I always thought that they're either prayer or gratitude hands. Thank you. or <laughs> But never like just a connecting high five. But yeah, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Indeed. Um, in Alberta, the race for the leadership of the Alberta NDP has changed a little bit. Uh, Nahid Nenshi had a big event. Uh, which there was a lot of people, uh, and there were uh, pictures of it. And you know, for example, when Pierre Podiev uh, keeps going to an event, he shows pictures and says that his crowds were about like three or four times the size than they actually were. Um, so there's been a lot of quips sort of going around like, well, gee, by Polyev numbers, there was like 353,647 people at this gathering for Nenshi. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I think Max Fawcett uh, showed a picture of the crowd and said, yep, that's it. It's done. And then, yeah, pretty much that was a sign that Nenshi had won, uh, has already won. Uh, so we had six candidates and um, uh, Raki Pancholi 
has decided to pull out of the race after about two weeks being in it. Uh, it seems that she uh, came to the conclusion that she and Nenshi were pretty much in very, very similar lanes. And that even though she had um, one of the best campaign launch videos ever, uh, at least in a long time. And one of the things that you have to understand about the um, Alberta NDP uh, race is be is the thing is it actually is a race. This seems to be a job that people want this time around, which is mm -hmm. very, very interesting. So um, when we saw Nenshi's video launching it, we were very impressed with it. We were saying, you know, that's the way it should happen. Uh, it was good. It was professional. It was slick. And you saw everything that you, basically anything that you wanted was right in there. And, you know, it raised enthusiasm. And as you can see, um, when he had his volunteer drive, there were so many people that showed up. And that's where, I, you know, a lot of people are saying, um, the launch was good, but really, what really is sealing the deal was the images from that day and the video right. that he did after from that day that let everybody know, um, yeah, you know what, I may not have history or roots with the party, uh, but gosh darn it, people like me. So, uh, but this I wanted to show because before there was Nenshi, there was Raki Pancholi. And uh, this is uh, what she had put out, uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you will uh, show it for the kids, mm -hmm. at the time that mm -hmm. she said that she was joining the race. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think we... Did I hear that? I can't remember if I... We heard probably it. heard it, but we didn't show it on the show. Okay, well, we'll... we'll because we we'll... didn't know enough about her at the time. And... Right, right. Give me a second here till I cue this up. And, uh... Uh, for people who are in Alberta, by the way, uh, our good friend Nate Pike is doing uh, something. Ryan Jesperson is doing it as well. But uh, Nate Pike is doing something where he's getting a conversation with each one of the uh, Alberta NDP uh, candidates. He's got four of them so far that I know of. Jody Stonehouse, Ranchi, uh, Racky Pancholi, uh, Karen Ganey, I believe. And mm -hmm. I believe Nahid Nenshi has already been on. So he's uh, waiting for Gil McGowan and uh, Sarah Hoffman. Still, so let's, have, let's have a look at this. This is, this is I saw this. It's a really well done. Uh, My parents yeah. moved to Alberta when I was four years old. Like so many new Albertans, they saw this province as a place of opportunity, a place where their kids could grow up and get an excellent education, a place where they could work middle class jobs and afford a home, a place where someone like me, the proud daughter of immigrants, could work hard and build the life they want. They taught me that in Alberta, Anything is possible, and that's what I'm teaching my kids, because that's the Alberta I know. Alberta is a place of hope, of optimism, of opportunity, a place where caring about each other is something we take pride in, and there's no challenge Alberta can't take on. But the story the current government tells us about Alberta is too small for such a big place. We see it in the choices they make, the fears they exploit, and the fights that they pick. But that's not the Alberta I know. Alberta is a place where we think big, where we don't shy away from a challenge, where we step up and we lead. We can have a strong economy and invest in each other at the same time. We can work together, find new solutions, and shape a changing world. And we can build a future full of opportunity for all of us. This is the time for us to make bold choices about the future we want for ourselves and our province. So let's continue to be the global energy leaders we've always been, while also leading on climate action. Let's ensure we are a place where having a home is always within your reach, no matter the size of your paycheck. Let's make sure every Albertan has a family doctor. Let's prepare our kids to be the best educated generation in the country. Let's focus on what unites us instead of the things that divide us. Let's be a province where opportunity is endless for all of us and all our children, because that's who we are. This is Alberta. My name is Raki Pancholi, and I'm running to be the leader of Alberta's NDP and the next premier of this great province. Join me 
and let's write the next chapter in Alberta's story. That was a really good, uh, yep. good promotional ad. For really sure. good promotional ad. Uh, she had generated a lot of buzz, a lot of interest. She was one of the first two out, mm -hmm. uh, putting her name in. Um, so it is kind of sad to see her lead the race because um, I have a feeling that she could have brought a lot to it, but I think that she has clearly concluded that she was in the same lane as Denchi and given his name recognition, mm -hmm. decided, you know what? let's just save the money and save the <laughs> save the effort uh, there. Uh, my guess is that she will probably be helping with the Nietzsche campaign in this case. Um, but yes, uh, we are now down to five. Um, some people are making some very nasty comments, as in... Um, sort of like... Uh, those two weeks were like the highest point in your career, or the highest yeah, point in your life. Yeah, I saw and those that's, you know, Sort of all you're going to do. Oh, well, there you go. I'm excited about my new role as executive chair for Nancy's campaign. So, yes, she is joining. <laughs> she's really joining yeah. executive chair of the campaign. So, there you go. Um, and uh, you know what? Uh, we've got one, another one from Nancy here uh, that actually features Racky Pancholi in it. Mm. So uh, I'll uh, give that to you, Mr. Grizzly, uh, to put up. Uh, it's about two minutes. Uh, but I'm sure that this will be a really interesting because if they've already got this out, and that came out uh, March 27th, 2024 at 4.53 p.m. on Nenshi's feed. So um, he's working fast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's working fast. Um, Just before we get to that, I've got another clip to share with you first, and then we'll show okay. that because this this goes hand in hand. Trust me. Yeah. So she has her uh, step down, step aside video too, which we could show. It's about three minutes and forty seconds. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the tweet that she said, "Running for Alberta NDP leader has been the honor of my career. I'm so proud to have, of the bold, hopeful, and optimistic story we told about Alberta. But today, I'm ending my campaign to support Nahid Nenshi in our shared goal of growing this party in every corner of our province." Um, so she uh, she explains that. Um, but if you would like to uh, play the one that we have here, let's see what uh, their initial collaboration looks like. Just a second. Hmm. Okay, we'll show this, and then I'll show the other one that I want to show you. This is this is their their uh, collab, if you will. <laughs> I'd like to introduce to all of you, in my hometown, on this stage, the next leader of the Alberta NDP and the next Premier of Alberta, Nahed Nenshi. So, I've always been an Edmonton Oilers fan. I bleed blue and copper, and I want to share with you my jersey that I've worn for years and years and years the slogan for the campaign. For Alberta, for all of us. I thought that that's how I would say it. That the emphasis would be on the word Alberta and on the word all. But what I've learned in the last two weeks is in fact, it's not the words Alberta and the word all that have really resonated with people. It's that tiny little word for, F-O-R. Because for so long, we have been trained by our political discourse to only be against. And it's time for us to stop being against. And friends, that is our mission with all of our neighbors, is help them understand. <laughs> is to help them understand that four is possible. So my friends, for Alberta, for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Nahadenshi! Okay, they worked doubly fast because um, her video saving that she was uh, 
running, uh, dropping out of the race was posted March 26th at, let's say, 10 a.m. And that evening, <laughs> she was in Edmonton <laughs> introducing Nahed Nenshi, I've now found out, and not Nahid. <laughs> so that's the proper pronunciation of his name. I've been pronouncing yeah. it wrong all the all the time. <laughs> so so have I. Yeah. Hello. So there thing. you go. Um, can, so can yeah, I have the, some room. Can they I have are. Some room? They are uh, working together, and uh, that's uh, some collaboration is nice to see. And uh, said it will definitely uh, change uh, things in the race a little bit. But uh, yes, um, she has uh, been receiving um, a little bit of denigration uh, as a result uh, of that. And um, I personally think that it's a good idea if you're in a race and you realize that somebody else is in your lane and you agree. Uh, you know, put the party first, and then mm -hmm. put the province first. And, Which is what uh, she's doing. Yeah, that's uh, for me. I, I have no problem with that whatsoever, whatsoever at all. So, good luck to you, uh, Miss Manjoli, and uh, hope you do uh, a very, very good job as executive uh, director of the campaign. I have a clip here that you need to see from. Uh... Executive uh, chair. Just the other day. This is, um, oh, this is good. If you've not seen this yet, this is so good. Oh, yes. Premier, um, I am very concerned about the fact uh, that um, you, and you're here to talk about and raise your concerns about uh, the carbon pricing, which will add three cents per liter on gas on, on April 1st. And yet at the same time on April 1st, Premier, you are raising uh, the uh, the gas tax in your home province to 13 cents, increasing it by four cents. I understand you were at an Ax the Tax rally uh, yesterday, I believe, with the leader of the opposition. Can you clarify for me whether you were uh, protesting? Was it a rally to ax your tax uh, on uh, the gas tax, which is adding four cents uh, to the to a liter? I, I, if you can just clarify that for me, if you were at a rally to ask the tax that you are increasing in your province by four cents. Um, Premier, um, I am very concerned about the fact. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was good. Yeah, that was good. Um, yeah. Which, so what, what are you protesting, your tax or, or, or the yeah. union? Um, so just to finish the, the little bit, however, uh, that I was mentioning on the, the Alberta NDP race here, uh, just for people to know, the Alberta NDP leadership race is a one-member, one-vote race, not a point system race, as been the case for many uh, party leaderships. And uh, so just, um, just that last little bit there that I wanted to add to, add to that. Um, the clip that you saw was from um, Daniel Smith's testimony uh, to that uh, government committee uh, to which uh, Scott Moe had testified uh, the day before and Blaine Higgs was going to testify on the next day and Tim Houston has still to testify. And um, judging by the panelists uh, from the At Issue panel, uh, because they had that yesterday, it seems that the Premier's showing up there to testify in the way that they have um, actually hasn't helped them, their cause at all. Uh, and, um, you know, you got even Andrew Coyne who doesn't hesitate, hardly misses an opportunity to take a swing at Trudeau uh, when he can, even agreeing here that uh, the premiers didn't do themselves some favors. Uh, as we mentioned the other day, who had Scott Moe basically saying, well, yeah, we did consider other methods, but they were too Oops. expensive. Uh, so then why are you objecting to carbon regulatory pricing then if it actually does have some success and is less expensive? Um, you have uh, Blaine Higgs. Uh, oh, yeah, and then Scott Moe saying, uh, well, I don't think we have rules. We should just, like, let them reduce their common themselves and not regulate them or frame them. Like, just rely on the goodness of their hearts. They'll see it, and they'll do it eventually. Um, the only thing that's going to do it eventually for them, if it isn't going to be in-house regulations, is an inability to export their product. 
And uh, let's remember, kids and cubs, that one of the reasons for which Christia Freeland, early in the Trudeau government mandate, had to go to cameras one day, pretty much in tears, talking about the European Union saying, if they can't make a free trade deal with Canada, who can they make a free trade deal with? Mm -hmm. Because the CETA free trade negotiations were being stalled. Now, these were negotiations that Stephen Harper had started and was supposed to finish, but he couldn't get them completed because there were certain areas in Europe that had a say and had a vote that were not happy with our climate policy. And the sticking point was our oil wasn't green enough to be sold or to be purchased by those markets. Uh, they kind of sort of, and then Christopher Freeland came in and, uh, you know, you can say all you want about Stephen Harper about getting off the ground, but she was the one that sealed the deal. Mm. She got the ball in the net. Yes. So, and uh, she's the one that got the two points on the board, not him. So, uh, and she was able to do that by overcoming that difference. Uh, there is going to become a time, and you know, that's why California, for example, even though the United States as a, as a nation has been dragging its feet on vehicle emission standards and all that kind of stuff, California has been going ahead because California was so, so polluted that mm -hmm. state representatives if they wanted to get reelected, knew that they had to do something about it. So they did it, acted with uh, the emission standards. And since California is, I think, what, on its own, I think, the seventh largest economy in the world or 10th? Something, something like that. that. There are more people in all of California than there are in Canada. No, I think we surpassed them recently. Okay, we might have surpassed that. But for yeah. the longest time, that was the case, right? It was the case for decades. So, um, when California decides that, you know what, we are reducing emissions by this much with new technology, um, pretty much everyone else has to follow. And even if the government, the Republican government of the United States at the time says, no, no, you don't have to do that. We're going to pass laws says you don't have to do that. Well, uh, sorry, uh, we've already started. So <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> even though you tell us that we don't have to, it's happening. We're doing yeah. this. I've just um, looked it up. The California population as of 2024 is 38,889,770. Okay. So, we've, so surpassed we've surpassed it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, this, uh, I forgot what I was talking about. But I mean, it, basically what it boils down to is California's GDP is equivalent to that of Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I completely lost my train of thought. I'm sorry, kids. That's okay. I've got a couple of topics we can uh, we can discuss here. Um, one uh, is... Well, I would like to, if somebody could remind me of what... <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. Okay. No idea what you're about to bring up. I, I, I don't know what was in your head, dude. Sorry. I mean, uh, my lovely spouse sometimes. What was I saying? I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you were saying. <laughs> I'm always lost. Don't you know that? Squirrel. So on April 10th and 12th here in Ottawa, the Canada Strong and Free Network is having a hate rally, I guess. I don't know what else to call it. We're excited to announce that the Honorable Pierre Polyev will be a keynote speaker at this year's Canada Strong and Free National Conference, April 10th to 12th. And I'm going to put a link to the... Uh, to their web page where it shows the list of their speakers and some of them are yeesh. <laughs> yeesh. Andrew Lawton um, for one uh, who else do we got here Anthony Fury uh, there's people here I don't know who they are it's interesting some of the people in this this lineup Daniel Smith Pierre Polyev Tony Abbott, Michael Chong, Jen Gerson, Kate Harrison. There's a, there's a collection of interesting individuals in here. Boris Johnson, former UK Prime Minister, former Mayor of London, mm. is going to be speaking at the Canada Strong and Free Network hate rally. I'm calling it a hate rally. You can call it whatever you want. I don't know, man. I just, some days I just don't know what to think. And this is one of those days where I'm just puzzled. 
little bit of history if if you're um for those of you who, who, who may not be aware on this day in 1966 george shivalo and muhammad ali fought ali called shivalo who signed up to fight 17 days prior called him the washerwoman he, ali won the 15 round fight and said shivalo was the toughest man he had ever fought and he still he said that that he was the worst the toughest fight he ever had shivalo had literally 17 days to train for a fight where you normally you train for months right so anyway there's some there's some history for you on this day All right um i remembered what i was talking about i was talking about the the difficulty in the exporting oh, oil okay. products um yeah so um if it weren't for internal government really regulation it would be the ability to export prices uh sorry the ability to export products uh, that would bring uh, corporations to finally make uh, the correct decisions with regard to uh, carbon uh, and uh, and selling our oil. So when Scott Moe goes to the carbon committee, uh, not the carbon committee, but this committee and says, you know, I just believe that we should rely on the good faith of these companies to do the right thing. We shouldn't charge them anything and tax them on anything. Um, that's not a workable solution. And then when you have uh, um, Blaine Higgs come in and saying, uh, well, you know what, uh, you really need to help us uh, explore uh, finding more shale gas. That's our that's our way out uh, of the climate thing. And then uh, you've got Daniel Smith saying, you know, uh, well, you know, if we uh, exported more oil to India or all these other countries that wanted that are using coal, coal or whatnot, we could get a discount. Uh, we we could get recognition mm. for that. And it's like asking, like, well, why wouldn't India want the recognition themselves for having doing that? It's like, what country in the world is going to say, hey, you know what? Hey, Canada, since we bought LNG from you to replace the coal that we're we're using, let's not count that in our column as something we did to reduce our GHG emissions. Let's give you the yeah. credit for that. No, that's not how it works. How it works is GHGs produced in your country. Because going around and saying, hey, like this, if we just like sell lots of LNG to all these countries to replace something and we get the credit from it, um, we are not reducing our GHGs. We're helping other countries reduce theirs, but we are not reducing ours. Yeah. It's basically an excuse, again, if a hall pass that they're giving themselves to not have to do anything. Let's just keep on ripping it out of the ground and putting it in a train or in a tube and doing absolutely nothing. Yes, because if other people use our product rather than another, then it's already better for the world. And we should get credit for having pulled it under the ground, out of the ground without doing anything to pull it out of the ground in a more clean way, in a more responsible way. without having to clean up our mess ever mm -hmm. because we only produce 2%. So let us just keep on producing our 2% and we'll help everybody else. If we, if we help you produce 90, if we help you produce 11% rather than 15%, can we still keep on producing our 2%? That's basically what these premiers are asking for. So um, the federal government, as we saw yesterday uh, with uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, with that clip saying, you know, hey, listen, premiers, um, this program was designed in such a way that you don't have to, your citizens don't have to pay the federal backstop. All you have to do is come up with a, your own made in whichever province, insert name of province here, uh, solution that meets at least these criteria and you're free to do what mm -hmm. you want. But these premiers don't want to do that. They don't want to make the policy choices because they'll have to wear them if people are not happy with them. So they'd rather just let the federal backstop apply and then say it's everything that's going wrong in your life. It's the federal government's fault. Never accepting responsibility for anything ever. It's the, it's the complete lazy mm -hmm. way out here. But what these three days of testimony have done is made it very clear to the world and to Canada that these premiers who are opposing carbon regulatory pricing literally have nothing to offer. Let's rely on technology that has not proven itself to date and is not upscaled and for which we have no plans and have expressed no commitment to financially back when it comes to upscaling. Give us more money to explore other types of fuels that are less polluting than coal. 
hey, uh, Danielle Smith from Alberta was talking about some nuclear stuff. Yeah, okay, th that might be in line, online by 2050. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, we just keep on polluting. In the meantime, we find more of her, her, her quote-unquote base load. It's just, <laughs> they have no None. solutions. And these com these committee appearances have made it very, very clear. I would be, again, if I were the liberals, I'd be pulling clips left, right, and center from this and putting them together and showing that just like they've got no plan. They've got no plan. As that uh, questioner, uh, he's, I believe he is from the Liberal Party. Um, wish I knew his name off the top of my head. Um, but that man is basically, you know, asking her, and this is, this, this is one of the things that Doug Ford actually did mm -hmm. do well in this case, because he announced that he was, uh, maintaining his gas tax cut. Uh, whereas Daniel Smith said, well, you know, that gas tax cut that I put on, well, oil isn't selling at as high a price as I need it to. So uh, I need that tax dollars now. So while I am actually going to put that extra four cents on the price of gas and not call it a tax grab, because it is, I'm going to complain about the three cents coming in from the carbon tax that everybody's known as coming since the last yeah. election because the scheduled price increases mm -hmm. has been made public. Like for five years, this is this is. They let us know five years in advance what was coming. It's not a big surprise. This, that three cents will curve your spine and make you choose between heating your home and putting food in your belly. But her four cents will not. Yeah. Well, it's uh, Courtney Delio from right? uh, I guess Alberta. Uh, uh, Courtney Terrio is a um, uh, midday 6.30 Ched, which is, I believe, an Edmonton station, CHED. Uh, yes. He said, uh, yesterday morning, Alberta Premier Daniel Smith called on the federal government to cancel its proposed carbon tax increase. This morning, or yesterday morning, the Alberta NDP called on the UCP government to cancel its increased restoration of the provincial fuel tax. And of course, my name's not Gordy. Barney Panofsky's best intentions had to reply with, and this is this is gold. This is gold. This is ridiculous. One tax increases the cost of living 23%, while the other one protects people from seeing wind turbines as they drive to work at the coal mine. I think that's great. <sighs> well, and it, it goes back to yeah. the to, to the uh, the the MLA is saying, are you protesting the carbon tax or your tax? Because your tax is more expensive. You know, I just, I just exasperated every damn yep. day. So they went there uh, thinking that they would have this big PR opportunity uh, and that they would own the prime minister. And they, well, the first three so far have performed rather poorly. Um, they show that they ha don't really have anything. They don't have any plans. Their plan is basically do nothing. Their plans essentially do nothing. Just let us continue doing what we've been doing all the time, all along. That's not been working. And uh, yeah, we'll do nothing. How does that work for you? Uh, which, of course, it doesn't. <laughs> it just doesn't in any way, shape, or form. So, yeah. Uh, not the best move. Hopefully the federal government will be able to capitalize on that uh, because, um, how would I put it? While carbon regulatory fees uh, themselves seem to have fallen out of favor with the public, uh, acting on climate probably hasn't, uh, particularly with younger voters. Uh, the main problem, however, is, and uh, I think it was Chantal Hébert who accurately pointed it out on the At Issue panel, is that while acting on climate still is a priority for Canadians, uh, as opposed to a couple of years ago, like pre-pandemic, uh, when people weren't facing the high inflation and the high interest rates, it's not that they don't care about the environment, it's just that there's other things that they care about more at the moment. Because they're feeling mm -hmm. a crunch now. 
So environment is, uh, you know, move like from number one or number two to about like number five in, term, in terms of a priority. But that's, again, those are numbers for the general public. Uh, that may not be the case uh, within certain demographics uh, specifically. That said, um, one also has to be um, cautious when relying on the youth vote saying, you know, well, the youth are really pro-environment, though. You know, you really have to do that if you want to keep them. Well, there are the ones that are not able to save for that down payment. Mm. So uh, that may not be um, a given. The traditional, the common knowledge or the common wisdom may not be uh, exactly what is needed. Uh, uh, at this moment or may not be as mm -hmm. obvious. So we have to pay a little bit more attention. Um, I think I have another clip from that gentleman uh, over here. Just, just um, a few of them. I just want to... Yeah, there's uh, there's a second one I saw. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to go on mute for a second and play a couple of okay. seconds because there were two of him that I saw and I want, just want to make sure that I'm not sending one. you yeah. no, uh, the same good. one. It's all good. The one that you just gotcha. played. It's all good, sir. I understand that. You want to? We don't want to be repeating ourselves if we can avoid doing so. Because let's face it, nobody likes a broken record or a skipping record, and we certainly don't wish to be that. I have, um, I have my dog sleeping beside me, and my lady curled up on a blanket beside her, sleeping and snoring right now, which I think is hilarious. Because when she watches this later, she's going to get mad at me for telling everybody that she snores sometimes. <laughs> But that is what is happening as we speak. And Lola loves to sit right in front of that very bright light I use for my green screen for some bizarre reason. She's, I think she likes the heat that comes off of it. And you know, yeah, this is uh, this clip you just sent me, sir, is from the same uh, individual. I don't know if that's... No, this is a longer clip that you've got. Yeah, I, uh, I showed the second one. This is the first one that you just sent me. Okay, we'll we'll uh, we'll bring this up uh, from the start, and I will show it in just a second. As uh, I got to queue it up here, there we go. I'll put it up and load it in, and we will play this clip and it, watch and enjoy. This is this is just this is simply delightful. Can you tell us whether climate change caused these wildfires and these smoke days? Yes or no. I, I would say that 60% of the fires are caused by human activity. And so we're doing a public uh, campaign to make sure that people are safer. Well, I, we I, also thought, have you would, I thought you would say that, Premier, because uh, I, I, I looked at a report from your own forestry and parks, uh, which stated that there were 1,121 wildfires last year. Of those, 91 were caused by arson, which is, which is uh, and, and that includes 262 acres um, out of the 2.2 million acres that were burned, it's only 0.1% of land that was burned was caused by human activity. Can you speak about uh, the vast majority that was caused by, uh, again, by drought conditions and, and the heat conditions in your province? And furthermore, the most important question, uh, Madam Premier, what are you doing to fight climate change and the forest fires and the drought in your community that is devastating uh, uh, land in your community and communities? Yeah. I, I, I apologize. 60%. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So this is going around saying that 60% of the wildfires were caused by human activity. It's not even close. No. It's not even close and not even one full percent of the area damaged by the wildfires were caused by, by fires that had human source. And of course, when they're talking about human source, their claim is always that somebody was arson. Somebody did it on purpose, as opposed to somebody who maybe was just didn't properly manage or properly extinguish a fire. Who knows? Or, you know, discarded carelessly a cigarette butt or something. You know, all, all the other ways that a fire can start or started a little campfire and whatnot, and there was an ember that went somewhere, and then whoops, whoa. So, um, but literally people like, you know, lighting a torch and, you know, setting things or pouring gas on stuff and then lighting it up. Um, that's the, that's their take. And of course, all of these people who are setting these, uh, 
fires, of course, are climate activists and liberals and whatnot trying to actually fill the air with smoke in order to create a situation that is so terrible that it'll make everybody say, okay, okay, let's, let's pay more for climate. The, the, that's the, the, that's the premise here is that all of us have decided literally us on the left to literally torch our country in order to get the right to agree to climate options. And it's beyond ridiculous. If you actually stop to think about it for a second or two, Right? So, oh yeah, that sounds good. But if you actually stop to think about it, for this to be true, what else also has to be true? It is damn right ridiculous. <laughs> Agreed. There's nothing there that makes any sense whatsoever. And we have, um, you know, Stephen Lecce from uh, the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party that says, Progressive conservatives reduced the fuel tax by 10 cents per liter. Liberals will increase the carbon tax by 23% as if it isn't expensive and enough to live. Share and comment below if you stand with us against this tax grab. Um, it's not a tax grab. It gets returned to you. Yeah. Number one, the provincial gas taxes are tax grabs. Now, Daniel Smith will turn around and says, well, we use that money to build roads, something that Stephen Gilbo says he doesn't mm -hmm. want to do anymore. Stephen Gilbo doesn't put a cent into building provincial roads. Never has. That's a provincial thing. Trans-Canada Highway, interprovincial links, that type of stuff, interprovincial bridges, things like that. I guess, but not the roads in your community. Not the road from downtown to where uh, the mining is happening. Federal government maybe contribute a couple of money in it in terms of an infrastructure or economic development thing. But in terms of we need a road here for because we need a road here, there's some money. Federal government doesn't fund provincial roads. It's not a thing. So whatever Stephen Gilbo had to say there has like pretty much no bearing um, on what it is she has to say. And besides, it was all torqued. Um, but when it comes to a uh, government's making the pledge or making the claim that they've reduced the fuel tax. It's like, let's be precise here. You did not re reduce the fuel tax by 10 cents per liter. You maintained a previous reduction of the 10 cents per liter fuel tax, which means that you maintaining that doesn't result in any additional savings for people. It makes no person's life better. It simply maintains the status quo. Now, if you're coming with another 10 cents per liter reduction, then you'd have something to crow about. But we took 10 cents off a year ago, and we're keeping that 10 cents off. Sure, it's a relief that there's not an extra 10 cents going on, as is the case in Alberta, where there's an extra 4 cents going on. But it doesn't. The people who had 10 cents off yesterday still have 10 cents off today. Their financial situation is not worsened by that, but it's not improved. So congratulations on patting yourself on the back for something you did yeah. a year ago. Trying to repackage it as something that you're doing now. Mm. 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 <laughs> <laughs> So, but again, that's, that's one of those things right up there with it. Record spending in health. We spent a dollar more. We didn't keep up to inflation or whatnot. Ah, yes. We cut the gas tax. No, you're maintaining a previous cut of the gas tax. Not the same thing. Nope. But nice try. Nice try. The, the, the points. Points for creativity and effort. Good, good try. Nice try. That's a good try. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, let's see what else. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. Can you talk for a little bit? I might have Kit Angel. I can always talk for a little bit. You know that. I mean, my goodness gracious me. I'm, I'm capable of filling airtime because... As someone who has worked for decades as both a, a DJ and an MC, I can fill airtime when needed to be filled because, let's face it, silence is the enemy in the podcast world. Whether it's a visual service or an auditory-only service, we need to 
of mm, as little silent breaks as possible because you can lose your audience that way. And I don't want to lose anybody. We, we want people to be happy and informed and enjoying the program and what we can offer to you. I just put a link in the chat for those of you who are watching on multiple platforms, because we are on multiple platforms right now. If you want to click on that link, it should be, uh, it should, it shows up in Facebook, YouTube, Twitch. Um, uh, it doesn't show up on Twitter, unfortunately, but I will go into the Twitter feed and uh, put a link directly to the program. So you, if you like, you can join us on uh, on our youtube and you can join the chat here let me just find the feed because we do have a, a live feed there we are i see it right now i'm gonna just paste a link to the chat if i cha yeah, paste a link to the youtube feed for those of you who would like to join and uh, you can you can sit and watch and and join in the damn fam while we uh whoops i don't know what's going on there my computer just went haywire for some reason it's trying to print something that's bizarre i didn't ask it to do that <laughs> That was very strange. Uh, oh, I don't know. Where did my link go? There we go. Just paste that right in there. So I've pasted it in a couple of different Twitter feeds, uh, Twitch, and in multiple YouTube streams. If you want to join in the chat with the damn fam, you can do so. All and right. uh, you can become a member of the damn fam because we're always welcoming more people. This is interesting. The walrus. Is that from the walrus? Yeah, the walrus. Oh, okay. This is from David Mosscrop. Interesting. David Mosscrop says, voters are begging for something, anything different. Why Polyev will win. Yeah. From David Mosscrop, a man who, as you well know, is, is a staunch NDP party supporter. He believes in punching up, never punching down. David is a friend of the show. He's been on a couple of times. A brilliant writer. And, and, oh, I should say Dr. David Mosscrop because he does have his doctorate. And he's saying here that uh, it's predicted that Polyev may win the next election. But I haven't read the whole story. I will give it a good read, though, because I'm, I'm, I, if your initial reaction to is to reply with but, 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 I've got news for you. The liberals themselves know he will win. It's time to understand why, to prepare, and to regroup. Interesting. And the very people he is appealing to will suffer under the most crippling austerity measures that would even make the UK conservatives blush. Yes, that is correct. As we mentioned on the show, Liz Truss's economic policy campaign mm -hmm. is the one that Pierre wants to put in place, except That's right. Pierre is not on the board, Canada is not on the border of an economic crisis and isn't trying to negotiate its place in the world again after pulling out of Brexit. That's why Liz Truss's failed. But uh, Pierre has a bit of cushion. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Interesting. You got anything else um, from that? From the uh, from the piece? Uh, from that piece? Oh, well, I, I can get into it. He's saying uh, it's Pierre Polyev's Canada now. That's what the pundits say. That's what the numbers say. It's a brave, perhaps deluded outlier who will take odds in the Liberal government remaining in power after the next election. Between February 15th and 21st, Abacus data found 41% uh, of surveyed Canadians intended to vote Conservative, well ahead of the Liberals who sit at 24%. Over at 338 Canada, a March projection based on a weighted average of polls had the Tories at 211 seats compared to 63 for the Liberals. All that shakes out to a greater than 99% chance Polyev wins a possibly massive majority government in 2025. The Liberals in their heart of hearts must realize how bad things are. Not that you'll get any of them to admit it as much. In December, Zita Astravas, longtime Liberal advisor, responded to talk of Justin Trudeau stepping down by claiming he performs best when there's a challenge ahead of him. There is indeed a challenge ahead. The hope and hard work spell that captured voters in 2015 has fizzled. People are strapped for cash, struggling, angry. The national average home price is now merely $660,000. The average asking rent for a one-bedroom apartment is 2000 a month. Households have racked up a record amount of debt. Consumers are missing credit card payments. More than 6.5 million Canadians can't find a family doctor. Interest rates remain high. Few across the country, especially in critical provinces and regions, now believe the middle-class dreams that Trudeau and company sold for the better part of 10 years. Uh, let me just go here so it's easier for me to see. Better part of 10 years... Uh, let me start that sentence over again, okay? Few across the country, especially in critical provinces and regions, now believe the middle-class dream that Trudeau and company sold for the better part of 10 years. 
the liberals face strong headwinds in Quebec, which is essential to their chances at holding on to power. Abacus found the Conservatives just six points behind the liberals with committed voters. In Atlantic Canada, the blue side is up, a staggering 17 points to 50% over the liberals. Ontario is as critical for the Conservatives as Quebec is for the Liberals, and there, Polyev's team sits at 41%, compared to 24% for the Liberals. We've seen this before. Voters have a long history of launching politicians to extraordinary heights, only to drag them back down and leave them lower than low. In 1958, the Progressive Conservatives, led by John Diefenbaker, won 208 of 265 seats in the House of Commons, 78% of the legislature, leaving the Liberals with just 48 by 1963, Diefenbaker was out of power and down to 95 seats. In 1984, the late Brian Mulroney won 211 seats compared to 40 for the Liberals, giving him one of the highest seat counts in Canadian history. Perhaps more remarkable was the fact that after the 1993 election, the PCs, led by Kim Campbell, with Mulroney now retired, were down to two seats and reversed to the fifth and weakest position in the legislature. Historical patterns aside, the sheer unlikelihood of what Trudeau is attempting can't be overstated. Not since Wilfrid de Laurier did it in 1908 as a prime minister won a fourth election in a row. The Liberals may be hoping that, despite the polls, recent past will be precedent for them once more. Trudeau appeared to be in trouble in both the 2019 and 2021 elections, but managed to hold on to government despite winning fewer votes than the Conservatives in each outing. Popular support and raw votes can't decide governments in parliamentary and electoral systems. Seat count does. This time, however, the inch for change is overwhelming. In a post on X, formerly known as Twitter, David Coletto, CEO of Abacus Data, Abacus Data shared that a mere 12% are saying the Liberals should definitely be re-elected, compared to 59% who think it's definitely time for a change in government in Canada. As Coletto notes during a campaign, it's hard to change a voter's mind when they firmly believe the government should go. In fact, for the last three campaigns, the desire for change number goes up, not down, over the life of a campaign. In this... Polyev is the beneficiary of timing. The Liberal government is approaching a decade in power, which is an eternity, even for a party used to long stints in Parliament. As a government ages, voters tire of the status quo and beg for something, anything different. Also, scandals accumulate. Many Canadians will remember the SNC-Lavalin affair and the Aga Khan trip. They'll remember the We Charity kerfuffle. They won't forget the more recent Winnipeg lab breach and Arrive Can procurement fiasco. Conservatives will be certain to bring up $6,000 a night hotel rooms and blackface photos. Even if voters can't cite details, they feel the worm is turned. Over time, the electorate stops giving a government the benefit of the doubt. For years after winning the 2015 election, Trudeau and his team seemed untouchable, Teflon-coated. Not so much anymore. Particularly as Polyev will relentlessly remind Canadians of every screw-up until the gist. Liberals are too corrupt to keep around. The article does go on for quite a bit more, but uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. It's um, it's troublesome to think that uh, people are so desperate for change that they will elect an autocratic, borderline fascist dictator who will bow down to his corporate overlords and sell us out for the smallest little sliver of pie. He doesn't care about us. So I hope people aren't so eager to change government, to vote the government out, as they are to, oh, I don't know, elect a government that actually will do stuff for us instead of harm us. Mm -hmm. Because a, a government under Pierre Polyev will be harmful. Will be harmful for the vast majority of Canadians. Mm -hmm. There's a few that will benefit from it. The wealthy few. The rest of us, yeah, will suffer. Indeed. Indeed. Um, got a couple of updates on some stories that we have been following for you um, with regard to the Israel and uh, Palestine situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to call it anymore. Um, well, somebody will pillory you for whatever title you put on it. So Yes, I know. I know. Um, here in Canada, we had that vote recently uh, on the NDP motion. Um, something that we didn't know when we were reporting on it is it seems that um, what happened with the motion, the liberal amendments to the motion, made it such that the entire debate that happened in the House on the 
motion that was originally proposed essentially became moot uh, because everybody debo- debated the original NDP motion. And it seems that the liberal amendments came in about 20 minutes before the vote. Um, now, the amendments were accepted by the New Democrats, which causes some questions as to why it is the New Democrat would uh, agree to have their motion uh, upended in the way that it was because the original motion called for an immediate recognition of a Palestinian state, uh, which does cause a problem for the Canadian government in the sense that uh, given that we are a pluralistic nation uh, with people from uh, significant numbers of people from both diasporas in the country, um, it is uh, the question of recognizing formerly a Palestinian state while Hamas is still in control of it um, creates some optic issues that are probably not the best. Uh, so the federal government did not want to vote for that. It seems that the NDP got some pressure from one of Canada's largest Muslim groups that said uh, they would prefer to have a motion pass that had substantial support than a motion fail or a motion pass that had, you know, just barely enough support. And -hmm. it seems that the NDP was open to listening to that. Um, So what was voted on in the House of Commons essentially was not that which was debated, which may explain some of the reasons why there were three liberal MPs who had some problems uh, with that and have expressed them. The end resolution, as written, pretty much ended up reiterating what Canada's traditional policy is. Two-state solution and all that kind of stuff. So it moved away from what the NDP was originally proposing. Um, The three Liberal MPs who had a problem with it were Marco Mendocino, uh, Ben Carr, who uh, the son of Jim Carr, uh, out in uh, Winnipeg, late Jim Carr, uh, great man. Uh, by the way, no. uh, who did a uh, gave a lot uh, in service to his country, um, but um, none have made a bigger issue of it publicly than Anthony House father, um, and uh, he's really debating his future. Um, he represents a yeah, yeah uh, but it seems that his issue so much wasn't really the bill, but what happened after the vote because when the vote passed. Apparently, there was uh, a lot of standing and cheering Mm. on the part of the liberals. Uh, And uh, that's the part that rubbed them the wrong way. Okay. Interesting. So um, uh, I think had the motion just passed and everybody had been calm and demure about it, like, you know, this is the decision, this is what we got to do, that's fine. But everybody seemed to be happy. Or the cheering and the clapping may have been construed as happy about getting out of that or or whatever as opposed yeah. to uh yeah let's just say it created a situation that could be misinterpreted um you know happy about not supporting israel as fully as one could um there is a reality on the ground here that we have to understand that um, even the United States, which is Israel's strongest backer, oh yes, they have that. wasted a lot of international capital yes. vetoing issues at the United Nations. Because you have to remember, at the United Nations, there's only one Israel, there's one Jewish state, but there are many Muslim and Arab states. Each country has a vote. So when the group, the overall group of Arab nations decide to get together and vote together to condemn Israel for something, this Israel has only itself. So therefore, it depends on its international allies to use its veto to encounter. <laughs> it's one of the reasons for which, that, that's a similar reason for which China, for example, is doing a lot of international development in Africa. Mm. Oh, yes. And it sort of displaced the United States because when there comes something at the UN where they need a vote, well, that's a 50 something country block. Yeah. It's a big block. They, they've uh, rebuilt railways. They've installed new train. I mean, they've done a, right. hundreds of billions of dollars worth of construction, reconstruction, 
throughout the entire continent. So, yeah. yeah. So there's stuff like that going, going on there. So the, that's what seems to have, uh, um, ruffled his feathers more than anything else over here. Um, Internationally, it seems that Benjamin Netanyahu has agreed to reschedule the delegation uh, visit that he had canceled a couple of days ago when the United States uh, did not use its veto to block a resolution at the UN calling for an immediate ceasefire uh, mm -hmm. at the time that he had announced that the delegation visit was uh, canceled. Um, John Kirby, who's uh, the White House National Security Spokesperson, uh, called that decision perplexing. And uh, it's, uh, pundits and analysts seem to uh, come to the conclusion that Netanyahu canceling the visit actually proved the United States right uh, for having not used their veto there. So I think uh, Netanyahu kind of snapped back very quickly. said, okay, okay, guys, it's on again, it's on again. Um, so we'll see what comes uh, as a result of that. Um, the United States wants some guarantees that if Netanyahu is going to go into Rafa, because it seems that he is going to go into Rafa come what may, he doesn't really care what the United States has to say, that they do it in a way that actually that there are some protections for civilians. The other issue is trying to get food in through the north, as we mentioned. Um, there are accusations that Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war and using it as collective punishment. And as we know, collective punishment is not legal under the Geneva Convention. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically, aid agencies are saying that 20% of the needed aid is currently reaching Gaza. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights says Israel is largely responsible for this. Famine is now a significant risk in Gaza, and Israel has legal obligations under international law as an occupying power to make sure that aid gets there. So it's not only you know one neighbor to another, but by mm -hmm. virtue of the fact that Israel is an occupying power in Gaza, they yeah. have specific international obligations that they must uh, adhere to. And it seems that they are not doing well, The argument being made is that they are not doing it at the moment. Um, this is leading uh, countries such as Ireland, for example. Um, and uh, Ireland has an interesting uh, history with the Palestinian issue historically as well, uh, back in the days of uh, um, when they were still having the troubles, uh, one of the flags that you would most often find in an Irish pub is the Palestinian flag. There was a lot of um, uh, sympathizing yeah. with each other's causes during the time, uh, based on certain parallels. Uh, a lot of the way that uh, for the reason that South Africa, for example, is objecting to a lot because they've been through apartheid and they are seeing some parallels. So uh, Ireland has joined uh, the South Africa uh, initiative to challenge Israel at the International Court of Justice. Now, like uh, I mentioned before, the International Court of Justice is where countries go. The International Criminal Court is where individuals and organizations go to get their um, issues resolved. The ICJ's rulings are non-binding. They don't really have any teeth. They do have a little bit of international weight though. Um, but just so you know, this is the, the ground that we're playing on. And um, Ireland has been seeking to intervene in the ICJ court case regarding Israel and Hamas. And basically their intervention will be a plea to broaden the definition of genocide to include among other things, the restriction of humanitarian aid. Currently, it's the case that if an occupying power is proven to have slowed down the distribution of humanitarian aid, it can be considered as a crime against humanity, but not as genocide. And uh, it seems that the government of Ireland is looking to say, um, yeah, we need to change that standard based on what's going on. So uh, a lot of history behind uh, all of this. Uh, there's also a report uh, going out uh, that uh, the Israeli military may have summarily executed two Palestinians uh, just uh, uh, over the past couple of days. It seems that they were unarmed and had white flags based on reports. Um, Al Jazeera uh, obtained video of the incident and uh, they claimed that uh, one of them uh, was shot pretty much at point blank 
and uh, later on uh, you can see a bulldozer pushing their bodies then burying them in sand and litter um being described as a suspected attempt to cover up the incident yeah i saw the video it's pretty harsh yeah so uh we'll see that uh on the united states side of it um, new polling from Gallup in the United States shows that there's a significant shift in the attitudes of Americans to the war in Gaza. A majority of Americans, 55%, now disapprove of Israel's campaign. And that's a 10% increase since November. So in the United States, the general public has gone from being majority, slightly majority, in support of Israel's moves to slightly now disapproving of israel's moves mm. and um in november half said they approved of the campaign now it's little over one third though the declines in support have been larger among independents and democrats because in the united states everything is divided independents democrats and republicans uh the decrease in support crosses all party lines so even republicans are less supportive in general just not as much to as great a degree as independents and um uh democrats so and uh for the president himself president joe biden his job re approval rating is no lower now than it was at the at the start of the conflict so uh what he's been doing so far hasn't cost him uh we also mentioned that there had been some negotiations between israel and hamas for the release of some hostages and uh it was uh Israel had basically said that they were all in for the agreement. They were waiting for uh, Hamas to say something. It seems that Hamas has come up with a counter proposal uh, to get a higher number of uh, prisoners released. Um, I don't know what their initial number was, but it seems that the Palestinians have said, uh, no, we want a, uh, greater than 700 Palestinian prisoners released right. in order to secure the release of 40 hostages. So we're going like ratios 40 to 700. Wow. Greater than 700. And it seems that Israel is uh, quite willing to let uh, 700 prisoners go uh, in order to get those hostages back. Um, yeah. So that's pretty much what I got on that, uh, the most uh, uh, recent things. Um, the only other thing going with it is that um, the use of the United States veto at the UN uh, was a bit of a surprising move in that I believe it was uh, Vice President Kamala Harris who was hinting that uh, measures like this could be coming. And it was the assumption uh, from pretty much everyone that uh, no longer supporting uh, Israel with the veto would be something that would happen if Israel had started their incursion into Rafah. Mm -hmm. Well, this happened before. So the United States walked their talk on it before mm -hmm. there was an incursion into Rafa, which means that, uh, at least according to both the fifth column, there would be only two other potential consequences now remaining if Israel goes ahead with United States disapproval. The first one would be the cessation of uh, sales of arms. People have been talking uh, cessation of sale of offensive weapons in particularly but not defensive weapons but it could get to the point where defensive weapons as well that would be uh, a sign that uh, israel uh, the government well, israel the government and netanyahu government has really crossed the line with the united states the other one would be very 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 substantial sanctions imposed upon settlers so those would be the two options left uh given that the not using the veto has already been played as a card. So um, things are getting, uh, shit's getting real. Yeah, no kidding. Let's put it that way. In Russia, uh, of course, we had the election recently, foregone conclusion, Putin won. Um, shortly after the results um, was the date of the 20th anniversary of uh, Russia's annexation of the Crimean, Crimean Peninsula. Russia calls it... Uh, the anniversary of its unification with Crimea. <clears throat> yeah, unification is doing a lot of heavy lifting in there. Um, but he hosted a big event. It was a made-for-broadcast spectacular with a concert prior to uh, his inauguration, because his inauguration is only happening in May. But, uh, you know, he won a victory with the largest support 
from Russians ever so far uh-huh. since he's uh, so he decided to throw himself a party sure, and sure. Uh, yeah. you know who else was in attendance at the party you know how the election was really fair the three Kremlin loyalists who were approved as opposition candidates were part of the ceremony wow Isn't it nice how opposition and government to Russia just comes together for a kumbaya? Yeah, I, I don't think that's exactly what yeah. takes place. But you know. um, so even though Putin got almost ninety uh, percent of the vote in country, it seems that Russians abroad weren't so enthusiastic about him. I wonder uh, why. <laughs> in in London, UK, uh, only five percent of people who voted abroad voted for Putin and in Toronto only 15%. Wow, that's higher than I expected though. Yeah. Yeah, the 15% was a bit of a shocking number for me too. Yeah. <laughs> when I read that. Uh, it also, um, in the news, it seems that um, Belarus, which is one of uh, Putin's allies, uh, Belarus actually has a, a leader that's even more dictatorial than Putin is, at the moment, uh, he actually lost the election and decided, no, I'm staying. I'm staying, and you, mm. and you, and you, you're going to love me. No, they don't love him. Um, but he may have uh, screwed his buddy Putin over because uh, it seems that somewhere along the way he publicly acknowledged that the alleged terrorists who attacked in Moscow were actually heading to Belarus, which um, I think it was like it took off all about, like, 30 seconds for Putin to say, we like this. I think that they were trying to escape through Ukraine. Hint, hint, and Ukraine was helping them. Uh, well, it, it, it seems that the, yeah, the, the leader of Belarus kind of ran his mouth a little too much and um, it's going to make it a little harder for Putin to try to sell that narrative in his country. If I was uh, the leader of Belarus, I wouldn't be hanging around open windows. Yeah, no kidding. I've got some breaking or staircases. News for you. Breaking news. Okay. Lou Gossett Jr., the first black man to win Best Supporting Actor Oscar, has died at the age of 87. Oh, no. Yeah, that was for uh, an officer and a gentleman he won the award. Yes. I remember yeah. watching that live when he, and he got the award. He walked up on stage. He said, this is for me and the other fella, and walked off. It, not, what did he say? Not, this, is, this is for the other one of us, I think it was. I can't remember exactly the quote. It's hmm. 42 years ago. <laughs> Hmm. But yeah, he he just passed away at the age of eighty-seven. I don't know. This it doesn't say what the if there was a cause or if he was just you know, the body eventually gives up, right? Eighty-seven is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, passings, uh, by the way, uh, in the United States, uh, former vice presidential candidate Al Gore in two thousand and uh, Senator Joe Lieberman uh, died at uh, eighty-two uh, hmm. from complications related to a fall. Um, he was the first uh, member, uh, first person of a uh, Jewish faith, who was uh, on a presidential ballot, in a, in any way, so uh, very uh, historically significant. Um, in uh, Haiti, uh, last reports are that Global Affairs uh, Canada have confirmed that 82 Canadians have now been lifted out of Haiti. It says that uh, there are about 3,000 Canadians registered with Global Affairs in Haiti. Not all of them have expressed a, a desire to leave. The last time we had reported, I think there was 300 people that had looked into it. There might be more by now. Uh, but 82 have been airlifted. It seems that they're able to get about 18 per day, uh, about maximum in and out, uh, from what I can tell. Um, and um, slightly different in tone, but it seems that in Spain, prosecutors want former Spanish soccer chief Luis Rubiales to get two and a half years in jail oh, wow. for sexual assault for the unwelcome kiss that he planted on star forward Jennifer Hermoso's lips live on TV broadcast to the entire world to see after Spain won the Women's World Cup of football uh, last year. Uh, Rubiales describes the kiss as mutual, which Hermoso vehemently and vigorously denies. Um, but yeah, prosecutors are looking for two and a half years for him. Interesting. So, yeah. 
Yes. I like it when we get to uh, check in with a couple of stories that we uh, that we had been talking about uh, every now and then. Sometimes it's not enough. Uh, you get a little bit of information. And it's not enough to, like to go into it like for five or mm-hmm. ten minutes and have a big discussion. It's just oh yeah, this little thing happened. But uh, I like to bring them to you because you know sometimes we wonder, gee, well, whatever happened with that? It's like oh, these are things that have happened with that. Oh. <laughs> uh, do you have anything, Mr. Grizzly? Well, just I'm going to go back to the well on this one when it comes to Pierre Polyev. And, uh, hmm. You know, he says one thing, 200 experts refuted who to believe. And there's a comment from Dale Thompson says, well, it's a mathematical certainty. There's more than enough of these 200 economists who are conservative leaning, but they've also concluded with pure analytical facts. The best way to combat climate change is with a carbon tax. Yeah, I'll believe the economists at this point. Well, yeah. I mean, why wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, come on. Let's, they're doing all of the analytical data mining to go through it to find out, yeah, this is the best way to do it. And this is not, you know, the parliamentary budget officer, the PBO, actually said, several economists had said this is the best way to combat it. Mm-hmm. You have uh, Laura Osman uh, writing for the Toronto Star. There's says that conservatives blast pro-carbon price economi- economists as so-called experts mm-hmm. yeah the federal conservatives say they won't be taking advice from so-called experts when it comes to carbon pricing after more than 200 economists signed an open letter challenging pierre polyev's stance instead the party is pledging to listen to common sense of common people the comments come after economists associated with universities across canada took aim at common claims in the heated debate over the policy they're pushing back on assertions the carbon price has driven up the cost of living and calling out opponents for failing to pitch a less costly alternative to reduce emissions. So they're basically borrowing a page from the, the prime minister here on this one. The opposition conservatives have been almost singularly focused on abolishing the carbon price in the lead up to the scheduled increase to the levy on April 1st. In response to the letter, Tories say experts are living comfortable while forcing a 23% tax hike on Canadians already struggling with the affordability, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's basically uh, all that they have in that uh, Toronto Star article. It isn't so much about uh, the letter, unfortunately, which is what I was looking for <laughs> when I looked it up. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I looked at it. I looked it up. Uh, so I will keep on uh, looking uh, for that uh, information here. There we go from uh, CTV. Whoops. Okay, Google did a really weird thing. It does that sometimes. It can be quite yeah, Google's funny. been acting weird lately. Yeah. I guess I've been hearing yeah. news reports too about uh, its search uh, engine. It's uh, uh, showing up. It used to be really, how I put it, uh, I would enter something. It would like, be like one of the first two or three hits, but now I often have to go down to the seventh, eighth, or ninth one to find the thing that I'm uh, looking for. Um, things have uh, changed a lot. Um, unfortunately, there. Um, so sorry, I uh, wasn't able to, to bring that in as smoothly as I would have liked for you, kids and cubs. Um, so so sorry about that. I was hoping to make a smooth transition here uh, to bring you uh, actually more information on what was uh, said in uh, that letter from the 200 uh, economists. Uh, and I will look for it, look for it for you and hopefully find it uh, before the, the show is over. Um, well, there's a... a- Yesterday, uh, JB was talking about uh, what uh, the Prime Minister had to say about how 80% of, of uh, citizenry get, get money back. And this guy said, I'm in BC and I get nothing. It's like, oh, it's, it's because Dude. British Columbia has their own program, which they've had for a number of years. And by the way, you get a tax credit from the province. Of course, you're not getting a federal climate uh, action carbon tax rebate because... The federal program is not in British Columbia. If you were smart enough to do a little bit of reading or were aware enough to know that, you wouldn't make a stupid statement like, I don't get anything back. And I find a lot of the people that say that, I don't I don't get anything back from the carbon tax. Have you filed your taxes? You have to file your taxes. If you file your taxes, you will get your rebates. If you don't file mm-hmm. your taxes, you're not going to get it back. You're supposed to file your taxes. Which reminds me, I have to do that. Because <laughs> I'm behind the eight ball on that one too. Yeah, uh, you know I just. Uh, you know. And 
so, well, since we're talking about that, uh, concurrently with all of that, um, there's been a report that's come out that says that the federal government is, uh, when we're talking about subsidies, government is providing billions of dollars in financial support for the fossil fuel industry, despite measures announced last year to limit certain types of subsidies for the oil and gas industry. The analysis released by the advocacy group Environmental Defense estimated that Ottawa offered up at least $18.6 billion in support of the fossil fuel and petrochemical industries in 2023. That includes $8 billion in loan guarantees for the Trans Mountain Pipeline, $7.4 billion in public financing through the Crown Corporation Export Development Canada, and $1.3 billion for carbon capture and storage projects, which still have not proven themselves. Climate activists for years, sorry, that last little bit was my editorial uh, addition, for years have been calling on Canada to scale back its support of the fossil fuel industry and instead prioritize cleaner, renewable forms of energy. Quote, this is kind of the litmus test of whether the government is actually going to take serious action, said Julia Levin, an associate director, sorry, an associate director at Environmental Defense who prepared the report. It's failing that litmus test by continuing to give federal subsidies. Environmental Defense's numbers are down only slightly from last year when it calculated $20.2 billion in financial support, even though Environment Minister Stephen Gilbo eliminated inefficient fossil fuel subsidies in July. The framework regarding inefficient subsidies is meant to phase out funding for oil and gas with some exceptions, such as for projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, support clean energy, or, carbon, or capture carbon and store it underground. Caitlin Power, a spokesperson for Gibbo, said Canada, quote, is the only country in the world to take the step of phasing out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. To this end, she said, the federal government is in the process of reviewing its tax and non-tax measures. But the new rules do not apply to public financing, such as commercially viable loans, which the federal government does not consider a form of subsidy. Mm. Um, oh, that's kind of interesting, yeah. actually. I thought, I mean, I can see why you wouldn't consider it a subsidy, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of like how it's structurally defined. Um, but, you know, if you're giving people preferential loans at lower interest rates, then they would have to, if they had to go on the common market to get it, um, that is a subsidy. That's exactly how we're doing our green renovations here at home, right? The, the 10 year loan that we're getting from the city with 0% interest that goes on our tax bill and then we pay it off. That's that we had to take that money out ourselves in order to do that. We would be paying, you know, seven, eight percent interest on that. If we had to take it off on the line of credit, we're saving that. So, I mean, technically it is a subsidy. It's just not, um, how do you put it? I don't know how to, how to, just, yeah. It's not like somebody wrote me a check and say, here, do it. But it is, you know, once we file all the papers and whatnot and, you know, that loan comes on and uh, we start paying it back and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, that, that technically is a subsidy. It's, it comes in another form, but it is a subsidy. And, you know, we may not have made the decision otherwise if we had to carry those charges as well. So, Yeah. Interesting. Uh, the federal government is developing a plan to, quote, phase out domestic federal public financing to the fossil fuel sector, which will be made public this fall. The policy will apply to financing provided by federal departments, agencies, and crown corporations, including Export Development Canada. The Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers says on its website that Canada's oil and gas producers, quote, do not receive government production subsidies, nor is the industry requested or expecting any such support. So they don't receive subsidies for production. They just receive subsidies for almost every damn thing else, <laughs> including trying to clean up their own damn messes, which they're supposed to do contractually. Oh, well. Uh, many international organizations, including the United Nations Development Program, the International Energy Agency, and International Monetary Fund, have called for an end to fossil fuel subsidies. Critics argue they undermine climate policies by distorting the market and delaying the transition to alternative technologies. So there you go. According to the IMF, global subsidies surpassed $7 trillion U.S. for the first time last year. Yikes. Wow. So uh, environmental defense is pressuring uh, finance minister Christian Freeland to include a tax on the windfall profit profits of the oil and gas industry in the 2024 budget set to be tabled by April 16th. Quote, we should be taxing those windfall profits profits and returning that money to Canadians to meet their climate affordability needs, uh, said Levin. 
So there you go. Uh, that's what's going on with regard to um, carbon subsidies. So because we always 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 have to look at uh, both sides, right? There's how much it costs us to go green, and then there's how much it costs us to keep doing what we're doing. Yes, and the how much it costs us to keep doing what we're doing is not only the costs of environmental damage, which the conservatives in Pierre Polyev stand up in the House and say that the parliament, parliamentary budget officer hasn't calculated, which we showed a clip yesterday, of the parliamentary budget officer himself saying, yeah, we did calculate that, <laughs> make an attempt to calculate that. Um, but this is the part that's almost never, ever, ever discussed, is how much are we giving in subsidies as well? Because when you add the subsidies and then add, for example, all the insurance payouts from last year for floods and wildfires and all that type of stuff, um, you're starting to talk about some real money here. Some of this money might be, might be some province greater than some province's entire health care budget for a year. It's a lot of money. It's a very, very substantial amount of money. So, uh, yes, uh, that needs to be worked on as well. If uh, if the federal government wants to be considered uh, very, very serious on this issue, it needs to uh, really move forward with ooh, what you do. I smacked my ear on my microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, really needs to move on, on the subsidies. So when we're looking at this, right, we're, we're saying that we're looking at it as a suite of uh, policies. You have your climate fee at the consumer level. You have the climate fee at the industrial level. You have uh, measures that are looking to transition people from dirtier, uh, and more expensive ways of heating their homes to less expensive ones, which is what's going on in Atlantic Canada. And there was a John Wilkinson, Minister Wilkinson, made a very uh, important point on power and politics yesterday uh, when all the provincial premiers are saying that uh, these people in Atlantic Canada, because they say it's regionally based rather than based on the home heating fuel, but everybody in Canada, because it is based on the mm -hmm. type of home heating that is using home heating fuel, they were not part of the 80% of Canadians who were getting more. Back in the day. Because they're paying four times more mm -hmm. for the home heating. Mm -hmm. So while everybody is saying, you know, like this, you know, you, you pause that measure for three years, you give them preferential. No, they were actually being harmed by the policy as it was. So giving them a break for three years on the carbon price while also helping them move away from it makes sure that they are being treated similarly to everyone else and will make a gain for the long run, a permanent gain in reducing the cost of heating their homes and in GHG emissions. So uh, that's the part of the discussion that they often uh, keep on saying, hey, well, you know, we don't want to do anything, to, but we still want to keep the rebate. Um, the people that are gotten the three-year pause, pause. Mm -hmm. The tax was not removed. It was paused for three years because they're already spending more money than everybody else to heat. So if they're the ones that most need to make a transition and they're paying the most for the heat and have the least amount of money and are not part of the 80% who are better off, then you got to do something. You have to adjust the program. And that's what they did. Um, so just putting that out there, that's a piece of information that very, very, very ever, rarely ever gets out. Well, I have a, an interesting graph here from Jim Stanford. Uh, at Jimbo Stanford on the Twitter, he says, there's no correlation between carbon prices and inflation. Inflation fell when the system was introduced. Inflation accelerated in 2021 and 22 after COVID shutdowns when carbon price increases were smaller. Last year, inflation decelerated despite a bigger carbon price increase. And I will pull up this uh, graph to show you because I think it's kind of interesting. You can see a, a spike and a drop. And here it is on the screen for you to see carbon tax 2019 uh that's the gray bar that goes up to 20 dollars 
And then in 2020, 21 and 22, it's at $10. 2023, it's at 6%, which is $15. And you can see the inflation axis. Inflation dropped even though the carbon tax went up. Yep. Inflation was down when the carbon tax came in in 2019 and went up during COVID and it dropped in 2023. Yeah. There you so, go. Don't let the liars lie to you any longer. Yep. The these these things don't move in lockstep. No. It's, it's just, just it's just <laughs> you know, I just get frustrated so often. So <laughs> often. I have right. a I just read something that I it just came across my feed. This is from two days ago. I, I have to read this to you because this is the bizarre of the bizarre. This is from Nashville, Tennessee. The pregnant woman shot and critically injured by a Nashville, Wal Nashville Walgreens employee last year announced a lawsuit against the retail giant, giant Wednesday. Oh boy. Travansha Ferguson is seeking compensation for the long-term health problems she and her baby suffered after Ferguson was shot seven times in the store's parking lot. She was seven months pregnant at the time and had been accused of shoplifting a tube of lipstick, accused of shoplifting. <sighs> Apparently, uh, Walgreens employee M Mitrius, Mitarius, I'm not sure, M-I-T-A-R-I-U-S, Boyd, confronted Ferguson in the parking lot when she alleg allegedly sprayed mace at him. Metro Police said Boyd then shot Ferguson, according to police. He claims self-defense is not currently facing any charges. Seven times he shot her? For a tube of lipstick? In self-defense, she maced me. Uh, okay, so, you know, in Canada, we have, we have laws about how you can respond. It has to be, uh, well, lethal force. We, only if your life is in, in serious jeopardy. She sprayed mace on him, so he shot her seven times. A pregnant woman. I, what do you say to that? It's just... Uh, I don't, I don't know. I've got no words for that one, man. It's just bizarre. But the worst part is if you go into the, the chat, uh, uh, the Twitter chat on the online and read some of the people defending the Walgreens employee, I'm like, what? Well, they stole his property, not his property. It's a tube of lipstick. If they shoot you seven times over a tube of lipstick, that is called unreasonable force. Oh, by the way, there's no such thing as capital punishment for theft under actually anything. She was accused of shoplifting, which she wasn't even doing. How do you, how do we get here? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Happier news. Yes, please. Much happier news. Lawmakers in Thailand have overwhelmingly approved a bill to legalize same-sex marriage. Lawmakers in Thailand, according to AP, uh, lower house of parliament overwhelmingly approved marriage equality bill on Wednesday that would make the country the first in Southeast Asia to leg legalize equal rights for marriage partners of any gender. Absolutely. The bill passed its final reading with approval of 400 of its 415 members. Wow. Yes, with 10 voting against it, 2 abstaining, and 3 not voting. Thailand has a reputation for acceptance and inclusivity, but has struggled for decades to pass marriage equality law. Thai society largely holds conservative values, and members of the LGBTQ plus community say they face discrimination in everyday life. The government and state agencies are also historically conservative, and advocates for gender equality have had a hard time pushing lawmakers and civil services to accept change. The bill now goes to the Senate, which rarely rejects any legislation that passes the lower house, and then to the king for royal endorsement. This would make Thailand the first country or region in Southeast Asia to pass such a law, and the third in Asia after Taiwan and Nepal. I didn't even know that Nepal had passed such a law. Neither I knew that know. Taiwan had, but I didn't know that Nepal had. The bill amends the civil and commercial code to change the words men and women and husband and wife to individuals and marriage partners. It would open up access to full legal, financial, and medical rights for LGBT. LGBTQ plus couples. Well, there we go. That's wonderful. And oh, and look at th this quote is great. Uh, I'm probably going to massacre this name. Daniel Forn Punakanta, a spokesperson of the governing Futai Party, 
fo- no, sorry, Fautai party and president of a committee overseeing the marriage equality bill said in parliament that the amendment is for everyone in Thailand, regardless of their gender, and would not deprive heterosexual couples of any rights. Quote, for this law, we would like to return rights to the LGBTQ plus group. We are not giving them rights. These are the fundamental rights that this group of people has lost. Words matter. Talking about returning rights to people. That's going to be cool. Uh, She noted, however, that lawmakers did not approve the inclusion of the word parent in addition to father and mother in the law, which activists said would limit limit the parental rights of LGBTQ plus couples. So uh, this is a new government in Thailand which took office last year and uh, had campaigned on this and made this uh, one of its major goals and has fallen through. So once again, kids and cubs, if you're paying attention, slowly but surely, peace, love, equality, and fairness are breaking out all around the world. That's excellent. Yes, that makes me very, very happy. Okay, uh, we're hitting the three-hour mark soon. Yes, yeah, so uh, I gotta, will... gotta show you this though, because this is um, this is funny. This is uh, take a look at your screen, sir. Oh my word! <laughs> They've been like that for at least an hour now, probably. <laughs> uh, for people listening at home, uh, Mademoiselle Fox and Lola are uh, both um, sleeping. Um, on the floor. style on the floor. Well, head to head. Head to head. Head to head. Yes. I think it's priceless. Priceless. Oh, man. That's so funny. I like that. Um, since we've got a little time, but it's Friday, it is Good Friday, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some Canadians who are uh, making us proud because we talked a little bit about them yesterday, but uh, there was a lot more to report. Um, at the World Aquatics Diving World Cup in Berlin, Germany, over the weekend, Ryan Weens and Nathan Zombor Murray took silver in the men's 10 meter synchronized platform, finishing behind Great Britain. And Kaylee McKay, who we've mentioned uh, several times on the show because uh, she does the, the very, 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 um, uh, the extreme diving uh, from the, the very, very high heights, nearly 30 meters up. Uh, and has won uh, some uh, international medals uh, for Canada and world championship medals for Canada there. Uh, she finished with a bronze in the women's 10-meter platform, uh, which may seem like a really, really short jump for her, <laughs> given what she normally does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm used to running a marathon. Ah, a 3,000 meter race? Sure. <laughs> That'll be a sprint. <laughs> That's where most of us, 3,000 meters, is like, <gasps> we're sucking wind <laughs> before we hit the first kilometer. Uh, but uh, yes. And then uh, Kate Miller teamed up with McKay to capture silver in the synchronized 10 meter uh, dive. And on the men's side, Weens, who we talked about earlier, uh, dove to a personal best to come away with the silver on the 10 meter tower. In judo, Catherine Beauchemin Pinard claimed the gold in the Tbilisi Judo Grand Slam in the under 30, 63 kilogram category. It was her first gold since winning in Abu Dhabi in October 2023 and her fifth Grand Slam victory of her career. Shady El Naha secured his first podium finish of 2024 with a silver in the men's under 100 kilogram kilogram category and the day prior team canada had two medalists from the under 57 category with jessica Klimkate claiming silver and krista deguchi claiming bronze both of them have been mentioned on the show several times uh they are among uh, the top performers in the world uh, in their weight classes there in uh, bobsleigh cynthia apia uh got to the podium with a bronze medal finish at the final international bobs Le Federation, I'm going to guess, IBSF, World Cup of the Season, which took place in Lake Placid. This makes her 10th World Cup podium, and she competes in monobob, so basically just one person Mm -hmm. in the bobsleigh as opposed to two or four. Uh, Team Canada's four-man bobsleigh bobsleigh crew of Taylor Austin, Shaq Murray-Lawrence, Anthony Couturier, and Devon McEwen finished fifth in their final World Cup of the season. Uh, but they got the gold medal at the Pan American Championships uh, that was held uh, in conjunction with that race. In ski jumping, Alexandra Lautit, whose father, I believe, you've met, Mr. Grizzly. Yes, uh, I have. Um, one, well, parents, I met both her parents and her father parents. and I became buddies. We met in yeah. Calgary. Uh, 
And I so was urging I, them, they've never been to Ontario. As I said, come on out to Ottawa. You got to see Canada today. You got That's the time to come. It's the best time of the year to be here. I said, the weather can go one of two ways on Canada today, though. <laughs> it is either the hottest place on planet Earth, which it has been on that day, or it's two degrees in pissing rain. <laughs> yep, pretty much. One or the other. One or the other. Yep. So uh, Alexandria Lotchett won the silver medal in the Women's Normal Hill event at the Fédération Internationale de Ski Jumping World Cup in Planica, Slovenia. And that was the final World Cup of the event of the season. It uh, secured her position as third overall in the Women's World Cup Ski Jumping standings. There you go. Uh, cool. Also, get kicking butt. Um, our athletes, I have to say, they uh, really 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 impressed me and um we also had some uh beach volleyballers do very well for canada recently i believe last weekend it was uh we had a male duo uh which is uh new for canada uh, well not new for canada but uh mostly the, the women have been much stronger than the men in recent years um but uh our duo of and i'm trying to find their names here jake mcneil being one of the two players and the other one being alexander william russell took home the gold medal from the, the bpt futures event in kulangata australia um, hmm. winning the championship there so uh making canada very very proud on the sand and then once again, uh, our golfers, for some reason, are having a ridiculously good year uh, mm -hmm. on the international scene. And it doesn't, uh, we're talking about them a lot, but I remember a time as I was a kid, like screaming, uh, scanning the sports column and looking at the PGA Money Leaders list and the tournaments and Canadians were nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, at the PGA Tour, changed. yeah, the Valspar Championship in the United States, uh, there was a guy named Mackenzie Hughes, Hughes, who finished third in that tournament. Adam Hadwin finished fifth in that tournament. So two Canadians in the top five at a PGA event, uh, which is quite an achievement. I mean, getting one person on the top 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes there were whole seasons we went by. <laughs> there was one Canadian in the top 10 ever in an event. So we got two in the top five here. So congratulations to them. Uh, at the Champions Tour at the Hogue Classic, Stephen Ames, who's been having a really good season this year, finished fourth in that one. So congratulations to him. And uh, at the PGA Tour Americas, the Bupa Championship in Mexico, uh, we have someone named Joey Savoy, who finished fourth there. Lauren Rowe uh, finished seventh. And Jimmy J Jones, sorry, Jones Jimmy finished 12th. So three Canadians in the top 12 at uh, that golf tournament. Canadians making us proud wherever we well go. Well done. Well done. Yeah. I've got a little uh, history note for you from uh, Craig Baird. I oh, think yes. And it's interesting. So, and this is something I'm learning of right now. I didn't know this. It is Irish Heritage Month which makes sense, St. Patrick's yes. Day. He says, I'm looking, in, I'm looking at the history of Irish Canadians in Canada. Today, it is Elias Disney. Elias Disney was born in Bluevale, Canada West, on February 6, 1859, to Irish Protestant immigrants, Keppel and Mary Disney. Elias was one of nine children in the family, born over the next 18 years. In the community, his father operated a farm and several other business ventures to bring in money. When Elias was 19, he moved to California with his father to find gold. Instead, his father bought land in Kansas, and the family moved there. In 1888, Elias married Flora Call and bought land close to where Walt Disney World is now. Mm -hmm. They had five children, one of which was Walt Disney. Elias never drank and rarely smoked. He was also a strong supporter of socialism and unions. He died on September 13th, 1941 in Los Angeles. I did not know that Walt Disney had a Canadian father until just now. The things you learn from Craig Baird, our friend at uh, Canadian History X, at Craig Baird. Just go check him out. 
if you haven't, if you're not following him, you should. Yeah, you want to learn about history and Canadian history especially, he will school you. He will school you. And and he always brings up such fascinating things because that's one I didn't know about before. Mm -hmm. Walt, Disney's, mm -hmm. Walt Disney's father was Canadian. I didn't know that either. No, I, 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 that. Th that's the thing I love about Craig specifically because he considers you know, history to be a whole bunch of different things, right? Not just dates and wars and battles mm, and you exactly. know, like this, but arts and culture and entertainment and sports and, you know, science and all of that. And he, uh, he, he uses it all in very interesting ways to make history, um, uh, very, very accessible. He even uh, got some profile because, uh, at least, uh, recently he, because he also does things, AI images mm -hmm. and asking, so he's asking for Easter bunnies representatives from, uh, all the provinces, Across the country, and, yeah. uh, the one from Manitoba, um, uh, a lot of people said, uh, he was like, hey, it looks like a bit like a serial killer, actually. Well, the, one from, <laughs> the, the one from Newfoundland and Labrador was, was a, a bunny rabbit in a pub having a beer. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's so on the nose. <laughs> so on the nose. Oh my and goodness. then one last um, Canadian who uh, makes us proud because uh, recently we had the Oscars, the Academy Awards, and there were several Canadians nominated for awards, uh, but one of them happened to win. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you will uh, put it up there. Sure thing. There we go. This the gentleman here on the left, Mr. Bren, ben Proudfoot from Halifax who won his second career Academy Award for co-directing the documentary short, The Last Repair Shop, about volunteers who fix school-issued instruments in L.A. He hopes the win will help the millions of young people who just want to play music. And uh, Ben Proudfoot, uh, as we mentioned, it's his uh, second Oscar, and you have uh, heard him mentioned on the show because uh, he won his... Uh, Oscar, uh, I think it was just last year mm -hmm. or two years ago, the first one. Um, and of course, I'm trying to find it now. And um, yeah, <laughs> again, having trouble. Uh, but it's his third nomination uh, and second win. And uh, can't, he won, yes, he won his first Oscar sorry in 2020 for the short doc, a concerto is a conversation, which is absolutely amazing. And, uh, you can actually look it up, uh, on the web. Uh, if you go to YouTube, a concerto is a, con a conversation and you, I think you can find it on YouTube and actually watch it. And it's absolutely just, 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 just fantastic. It was, um, uh, a short uh, documentary that co-tracted, uh, that, sorry, that tracked his co-director, Chris Bauer's lineage through his 91 year old, jazz pianist grandfather. Mm. Very cool. Uh, so sorry, that wasn't his first, was it his first win? No, that, that was his first nomination in 2020. And then in 2022, he won the Academy Award for a short documentary, the queen of basketball about the late basketball trailblazer, Lucia Harris. Yes. So his latest film, The Last Repair Shop, also co-directed by Bowers, is set to compete in the Best Documentary Short category. He said, it's something that it's not something that I ever expected would have come this early in my career, says about his Oscar success. If there's a through line in this films, it's that they're all stories that are lifting up people who deserve more credit. The Last Repair Shop, those people are the skilled technicians who work at the Los Angeles United School District's 64-year-old musical instrument repair workshop. It's one of the last in the United States to offer free instruments and free repairs to students. The film profiles four of the shop's technicians, as well as a few of the tens of thousands of students whose lives have been enriched by their work. So um, there you go. And he won. Uh, I believe there, there were four Canadians in all uh, nominated for Oscars this year. Uh, but Bren Proudfitch is the is the one that, that was able to bring home uh, the hardware. Well done, good so, sir. So there you go, celebrating Canadians who make us proud. All righty, all right, get some cubs. Wrap this puppy up. <laughs> Kit Saucy goes, dude is the same age as me and has two Oscars. I am questioning things. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm 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 almost double his age, and I have no Oscars. So just... Ben, you damn overachiever! <laughs> Stop making us look bad. <laughs> Actually, you're not making us look bad if you're bringing home Oscars, my friend. Mm. Way to go! Look Way to go! Way to go! Um, Kits and Cubs. That's the end of our good Good Friday episode or hopefully good, good Friday episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. And if you do not want to miss an episode, well, hey, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl because she has sponsored our pod page. So if you scan that QR code that has just appeared underneath my goatee, or if you are listening and go to your computer or use your cell phone and go to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. If you click subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly to you. If you would like to support us in other ways, make like Kit Elaine and go to our true north eager beaver media incorporated YouTube page on, well, YouTube. Of course, <laughs> my, that was my mouth going faster than my brain there. And uh, <laughs> go to our YouTube page on YouTube. Me use words real good. Um, <laughs> if you, uh, there we have three buttons for you. There's like, share, subscribe. Click one, click two, click three. Hey, make us happy because when you click our buttons, it brings us joy. So uh, put a little something in our Easter basket. It can Click our buttons. We like that. And if you'd like to help us in other ways, speaking of putting something in our Easter basket, you can make a contribution to the Eager Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund. If you happen to like what we do, like our programming, like our content, like us, or if you feel sorry for us, we take pity money. We do. We have no pride. We have no shame. But if you scan that QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head, that will bring you to our coffee page. That's coffee spelled K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And if you make a contribution to our emergency hydration fund, uh, eventually on the show, you get a shout out because we uh, thank all those who do. And uh, we make a point of doing it publicly because, <laughs> well, it means a lot to us. Uh, any help that we can get, we definitely appreciate. Now, of course, if you're not able to donate, please do not worry because the gift of your attention is the one that is the most important and precious to us. And you, of course, you can help in other ways by retweeting and uh, sharing and letting people know. If you happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, please give us some likes and stars, some reviews, all that good stuff. Apparently that feeds the algorithm and makes us easier to find. Same thing for YouTube. If you like, share, and subscribe, that helps as well. So um, to help us out that way. We really, really appreciate that. Um, because democracy is something that you do. Write those letters. And... Um, if you have um, uh, an opportunity to, um, uh, this will probably be more for the kids on the chat uh, mm -hmm. than the kids listening. Uh, but if you have an opportunity to uh, thank Kit Angela uh, for the work that she's been doing, uh, that would be really fantastic. And the reason I am mentioning this is uh, because she's essentially a one person operation. And um, she had started a GoFundMe um, for Camping for Kindness 2 in Hamilton. And um, I'm not sure it got promoted the way that it needed to, given that she was on the ground. Um, but her goal was to raise $5,000, and she has raised six hundred and seventy. dollars and the last donation came in nine days ago. And the one before that came in four days before that. Um, so I'm going to put the link here in the chat for the kits and cubs. Uh, for those listening at home, it's gofundme.com slash F slash camping for the number four kindness, the number two, all in one word. So camping number four kindness, number two all in one word. Uh, and uh, if you would like to uh, make a little donation because, um, you know, equipment, tents, uh, being able to arrange for outhouses, food, 
uh, for everybody that was there. Um, th there were some costs to that. Um, yes, as Kit Saucy says, Angela is on fire and needs a team to help her. And uh, had I known about the GoFundMe earlier, because uh, we are uh, officially uh, supporting Camping for Kindness too, uh, she asked for our support uh, in any capacity that we could, uh, and we said yes to this. Uh, so um, unfortunately, um, I did not know about uh, the GoFundMe because I would have been promoting it uh, a whole lot more while uh, the protest was going on. But uh, she got results. Oh, yeah, she, she got did. results. She convinced the mayor to use her strong mayor powers. And uh, I don't... Uh, oh, the GoFundMe page says the organizer has disabled new donations. Oh. Oh. Well, that's a shame. Well, here, let's do it this way. Um, if you want to donate to us via our coffee page, please do that. Uh, but if you want to donate to Angela, because this one is closed, uh, if you press the donation through through our coffee page and uh, write in the comment section that it is for Angela, uh, we will make sure that it gets to her. All right? Uh, so do that instead. Uh, coffee, ko-fi.com slash eagerbeaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. Uh, this is something that we've done before when I uh, yes. was raising money for, um, uh, oh, darn, uh, the Rainbow Railroad. Uh, there was two people uh, that, uh, one or two people that made the donation through our coffee page. And uh, w w the reason for which we ask you to write it specifically in there uh, is one so that we know <laughs> for us that the donation is not for us, that it's for there, mm -hmm. but also be, uh, because coffee, everything is public. Uh, everybody in the public transparently will know what the amount donated there was, and uh, we will pass it forward. And uh, yes, uh, even though we have a, a little bit of a service fee uh, from PayPal uh, for those donations, uh, we will cover uh, the service fee and make sure that 100% uh, of your donation gets forward uh, to, to Angela for that. So uh, because democracy is something that you do, uh, make a donation to Camping for Kindness, say for Angela or for Camping for Kindness uh, in your comment, and uh, we will definitely transfer the money over and make sure that uh, she gets it. All right. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom, please? You know, I'm trying to come up with something this morning, and I'm kind of bereft. I mean, we're, we're three hours and 16 minutes in here, and I'm just, I need to go lie down. <laughs> Take a nap today if you need one, because I do, because I've been up since five, and uh, yeah, I'm very tired. I got to take a nap. Like my lady who just had a lovely nap beside our puppy dog, who is still sound asleep right beside my feet. Aww. All right. Then, hmm? Mr. Grizzly, oh, I she's, think it's time. She's, put oh. your headphones on. Oops. Come, come into frame. Come into frame. We have words of wisdom from... Actually, it's more of a question for Douglas. Oh. Um, can we see your, I mean, we're going to come see you live, but can we see your show online? Uh, no, uh, we're not online, uh, unfortunately. I think, though, however, uh, we might, uh, I think they negotiated something that uh, the individual actors might be able to get a video of it which means that uh, I'd be able to watch it at home at some point. But uh, no, okay. there, there is uh, no online. Uh, uh, we didn't buy the rights to, to, to broadcast okay. the show live uh, right. online. Well, okay. That was going to be my, my idea was like, let's all watch Douglas online. Um, uh, when, we, cool. when we, when we, this is more of a question and it's not words of wisdom, but um, when we come visit you, um, I have uh, one of my son's friends is in theater in Kingston. Nice. And I was wondering if we could, um, I'm going to invite him to the show, if that's okay. Yeah. To meet you. And We're not going to be able to go. So show, show is sold out. Oh, oh you didn't okay. have your tickets yet? No, we didn't. We didn't oh, sorry. Tickets. Well, at some point, we'll find a oh. way. But uh, I, would, well, I would just love for you to meet him. His name's Daniel, and he's okay. the sweetest sweetheart of a sweetheart like you. And he's in theater wow. and computer science at Queen's. And uh, I've told him about you, and I just thought, you know, we'll make it work some sometime. It'd be really nice if uh, if you two met, he's you'll, he's a sweet, sweet soul. He's been in my life since he was four years old. He's uh, the son of a friend, and he's my son's friend. And um, he's a great. I, I came to watch him perform in Kingston with my son when he was in. I can't remember where, but um, yeah, I just think you two would be like really like thick as thieves, if that's like an appropriate that. expression. <laughs> 
Today it is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if it is. I just woke up from I a nap either. on the floor. I just I just had a nap on the floor with the dog. Yes, we saw. We posted. Oh please. Oh yeah. Take that down. No, no, <laughs> right terrible. here. Right here. It's so up sure. now. It's up now. Oh, super. That's great. I love that's exactly how I want to be remembered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, um, are you are you guys able to come tomorrow? No. No. Uh, okay. Well, actually, there, there was there were some tickets that picked up uh, for tomorrow. So why, I would check. Why can't you tomorrow? I have too much to do. I have things I got to get done because Sunday's the yeah. tomorrow's Sunday's the holiday. Tomorrow I've got things to take out and get done. Ah, oh, damn it. Okay. Thanks, Douglas. For the yeah. But uh, I'll, I'll look to see if there might be some tickets that free up in the second week. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, let us know. Oh. Yep, I will. Yep. I, I've Morning. already put the call out to if, uh, anybody uh, from the group here is that there are some tickets uh, available next week to, to let me know. <laughs> Thanks, Saucy. <laughs> <laughs> well, regardless, whether we can see you or not, just have a... Break a leg or whatever you people say. Break a leg. Break a leg. The right yep. thing. When it, yep. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so sad. Yeah. I thought it's you had your just, tickets already. No, no. We just, I don't know. You get, we get busy and we get this 80 pound baby beside us here that takes up a lot of, a lot of headspace right now, which I'm fine with. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I love every minute of it. It's just, you know, you get tired. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, there we go. We have the words of wisdom. We have the Not democracy really. something that you do. So, Mr. Grizzly, please roll in credits and we'll be back with a little Easter egg. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. So um, before uh, everyone, if you are observing, goes away and uh, celebrate uh, their Easter, I hope it's an absolutely wonderful uh, Easter celebration. I hope you're, you're surrounded by family and friends and love and laughter and good food and good company and all that good stuff that uh, make the occasion uh, make the occasion um, wonderful. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what day Passover falls this year, uh, if we're in the, the same period or not. Uh, but if you're celebrating that, and I know that we're in the middle of Ramadan as well, so uh, there's a lot of people celebrating a lot of things uh, these days. So um, please uh, celebrate uh, responsibly, uh, but do have fun. Uh, and uh, yes, so, so Passover is not until end of April. It's uh, late this year. So there you go. So have a wonderful Easter. Enjoy the long weekend for those of you who are doing so. And uh, if you have... Uh, a little uh, moment to, to cheer for some Canadians. Uh, put a little cheer in for Gabriella Dabrowski, who's our uh, doubles tennis ace, who's in the semi-final of a huge tournament in Indian Wells, one of the big tournaments of the year. And uh, based on rankings, uh, she is best placed to win. And also for uh, Rebecca Marino, who's also uh, competing at a tournament at San Luis Potosi in Mexico. And uh, her situation is a little interesting because she's in the semifinal without ever having played a match yet. Wow. <laughs> the first round and second round opponent uh, turned around and said, ah, sorry, we can't play the match for some reason. Uh, so uh, they got two walkovers. So, so they're really fresh. So hopefully <laughs> they can score a win today. All right, kids. Alrighty. I'm going to go take a nap. I'll see you. Have a beaverific weekend. Paint your nails. <laughs>